Yeah. I'm just a little peon, Mike. <laughs> so you took them out for their birthday, did you? That's what he said. Yeah, we went to M's. We M's Dance Cafe, Cafe yeah. right downtown. So you must favor one sister over the other. You wouldn't give me Ada's number, but you gave me no, Grace's number. No, I, I thought you said you, you had Ada's, but... Uh, I'll, oh, I I'll, didn't have Ada's. I'll shoot it to you for future. All right, thank you. Are you back yet, Allison? Pardon? Are we live yet? No. no. One minute. Yeah. Allison, quickly. <clears throat> the, the, um, you can hit me up. The bylaw that was put on the Facebook page and in our website, it calls it Gary Street, not Gray Street. I'll fix it. Yeah, I saw that. Okay, it's nine o'clock and we'll start our meeting. Uh, welcome to the Corporate Services Committee today. Um, disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof. Seeing none, we'll move on to consent agenda. I would like, if nobody else is going to pull, I would like to pull the D12 uh, Council Abeyance list, please. Okay. Hold it, hold it. Sorry. I missed one. Member Cox, you want to pull something? No, it's okay. It, it, they're going to send that out, so it's okay. The well, I think I should pull D1.3, please. Sorry. Okay. 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 Correspondence. D21, Peter Frost, refloating <clears throat> container cottages. Who would like to speak to that? Oh, I don't think anybody pulled that one, Madam Chair. Oh, that was, sorry. Adoption of regular agenda. <laughs> uh, right. So the motion reads that the agenda be adopted, including consent items with the exception of items D1.2 and D1.3. We need a mover and a seconder, please. Moved okay. by Member Betsworth, second by Member Stevens. All in favor? Um, so, okay, carried. So we'll move on reports from officials for direction F11, or F1, uh, recreation facilities, F11, Utah Trail, trailhead accessible and parking. Um, is that Derek? Hey, good morning. morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, yes, uh, so this report just describes the uh, the project and the budget exceedance position that we're in. Um, so this project was actually scheduled to be done in 2021 and uh, it was carried forward into 2022. It does have some county funding associated with it. And so uh, not proceeding with the project does um, put that funding at a bit of a peril. Um, so we are recommending that we increase the funding from the capital reserve and, and improve the trailhead. It will provide a better accessible trail walkway from the parking lot that will be improved all the way down to the trailhead uh, where you get to start on the Utah Trail. Okay, any discussion on that? Okay, Allison. Certainly, motion reads that recreation report number R22-012 dated May 25th, 2022, with respect to the Utah Trail Trailhead Accessibility and Parking Lot Upgrades be received, and further that the bid received by KJ Excavating the amount of $80,242 excluding HST be accepted, and further that the additional 37,000 required to complete the work be approved, and further that the deficiency be funded from the Capital Reserve. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Member Stevens, second by Member Taylor. All in favor? That's carried. Keeping with Public Works, F21, Speed Limit Review, Utah Line. Derek? Yes, thank you. So the uh, as we go through the, uh, the, the list, if you will, of speed limit reviews, we capture data and we do a wholesome review of each site in spe like specifically. Um, so this, this one here at Utah Line between the City of Aurelia Limits and Division Road West, uh, was found to be in an operating speed um, and a road geometry that would permit a 60. Um, so 60 is the recommended uh, maximum speed limit. We're recommending that we go with the uh, recommendations from the Transportation Master or Transportation um, Association of Canada and our policy. And we, once approved, will install the signs and amend the bylaw. Okay, uh, Member Cox. Through the chair to Derek. Thank you, Derek. The uh, residents on that road will be very happy. <laughs> Thank you. 
They'll be happier when we put pavement down, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> move her into seconder, please. Um, oh. Moved by Member Betsworth, seconded by Member Burkett. All in favor? Oh, Madam Chair, would you like Thank me to read the motion? motion? Maybe you should. That'd be a nice thing, Allison. <laughs> would you please read that motion? Certainly. Uh, motion reads that Public Works Report number W22-019 dated May 25th, 2022, with respect to a speed limit review, Utah line be received. And further that the posted speed limit on Utah line from City of Aurelia limits to Division Road West be set at a maximum of 60 kilometers an hour. And further that bylaw number 2017-28 regulate traffic and speed limits on highways be updated to reflect these changes. Okay. All in favor. And that's carried. We be along to F22, pedestrian crosswalks upgrades. Derek. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so as most of council probably is aware, the pedestrian crossover at Marchmont um, and Coldwater at the Mill, uh, Mill Street, sorry, is uh, had some compliance issues, um, both reported by the public, noticed by staff and, uh, and relayed by the urban police. Um, so in 2022, we had a capital project to, to undergo some enhancements to the, the crossing and to look at the overall fe feasibility of the crossings themselves. Um, we had retained uh, Tatham Engineering um, to do that study with us. Um, they had performed their site inspections and some measurements and have come up with an option, two options actually, uh, focusing on one is an enhanced level B. And I think Allison may have a, an image that I could share on the screen that um, shows what an enhanced level B might look like. And uh, what it is, is right now we have uh, signs and a pedestrian crossover level C, and that has a rapid flashing indication beacon on each post and a regulatory sign for stoppage as long and uh, pavement markings. The enhancement would add arms to those poles um, bring additional regulatory signage out and we'll add two new rapid flashing beacons on the poles overhead. And we think that will encourage uh, you know, pedestrians to both feel that they, uh, they are at the right location for crossing um, and also uh, road users to have a better visibility of the signage and the uh, um, rapid flashing beacons. <clears throat> I'll see if Allison has that before I move on to the IPS. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, well, Allison's bringing that up. Member Paquette, you want to comment? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Derek, for bringing this report forward. Just for the benefit of Council and what's actually happened at the crosswalk <laughs> in Marchmount, the lights on a in the afternoon when the sun is, is setting on the on the south side, you're unable to see those tiny lights that you see in the uh, <clears throat> below the pedestrian that's walking on top. When they flash and, and what's happening are cars are actually going through the crosswalk because they can't see the lights. So I'm not sure, like these these aren't shielded, Derek. Like are, are they gonna be better than what we have, do you think? Because it's the glare from the sun that's causing the motorists not, not to see these lights. Yep, through the chair. So <clears throat> the standards are pretty set. These devices are common across the entire province and most of actually the world. Um, so there are no shields on these particular devices. We did check with the manufacturer. Um, the the consultant there, like Tatham Engineering, is is recommending this as a design um, upgrade and enhancement to what is traditionally not having the overhead flashings, just the the white sign. Um, so we, we're already going outside of the Ministry of Transportation's design guidelines a little bit to better enhance the visibility of these units. Um, but uh, certainly I can show a second photo of, uh, you know, what we could consider. So that's approximately $20,000 and it would have very similar um, infrastructure, i.e. the rapid flashing signs. And uh, if we're having visibility there now, we may have visibility in the future. So there is always a risk with only upgrading the existing PXO. Council may direct staff to sort of abandon the PXO altogether. Um, it's a relatively new device used in the province. Um, there's definitely been a lot of conversation around their effectiveness. And uh, so a second option is to simply abandon the, the PXO design and go with a mid block or an IPS that's an intersection signaled for pedestrians only. 
Um, this is the much higher cost, of course, uh, to install something like this would require additional design as well, but we've already retained Tatham so that can be streamlined. And, and these, these infrastructures are uh, uh, a little bit more in, in a higher setting for both vehicle uh, speed as well as vehicle volume mm -hmm. and the pedestrian demand. So this is going to widely exceed the warrants that are already at this location. However, it's definitely the road authorities option to provide a higher level of infrastructure, just not necessarily a lower one. So Derek, I don't know about, like if the sun's <laughs> shining on these lights, even when you're at one of these stoplights like you're showing there and the sun's shining mm -hmm. on, they're still hard to see. And unfortunately, the three o'clock time when the kids are coming and going from school is when that sun is kind of coming there. So I, I don't know about the extra cost if it's that more beneficial, but um, I don't know whether council feels we, or committee feels we just need to try something for now and see, but uh, going forward. Okay, Member Cox. You've I threw the chair to Derek. Derek, how much is the second one with the, the regular lights? like this? Traffic lights. Yeah, How much so, extra? The other one was 20. How much extra was this one? Yep, for sure. Through the chair, um, our estimate is approximately 180,000. Now, okay. there's a lot of um, sort of variability with that. We do have to obtain hydro, but it's pretty close by. Um, so that's a that's a fair estimate and it adds a little level C cost estimate. So it has a bit of variance to it. Okay. Hmm. I, uh, I'm kind of leaning to that only because of the fact it's children crossing and we know that that is an issue already there and we know that there have been almost accidents and I mean $180,000 and if we, we had to come in with uh, crossing guards which we all know every municipality is having trouble trying to keep and train and the cost of training them and doing all that I, I kind of leaning towards doing the traffic lights for safety because I know at Warminster they're having issues with that same style and people aren't aren't noticing them flashing even above. They've got that petition out. Thank you. Member Burkett. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. So the the lights that in the second diagram that Derek brought uh, or showed on the screen, they're actually shielded. So you would be able to see the, the lights that are either red, amber or green. My only concern, Derek, is the lights in Washago and there's road work that needs to be done are at 360. And I know from the different, uh, when we were able to attend good roads, a set of lights uh, in a four road intersection was 90,000 to buy. So I'm curious, like, did we tender it out to get the $180,000 figure? Is that like, how did you arrive at that? Yeah, through the chair. So it really depends on what you're you're referring to uh, from good roads in in that cost estimate of ninety thousand. Um, infrastructure cost has gone significantly higher, as as you may know. Um, that that cost is actually a, a contemplated change order cost from Guild Electric, who is currently awarded the project at uh, County Road One Sixty Nine in Muskoka Street. So we understand with some confidence that that's a relatively accurate figure of one hundred and eighty. Um, as you know, some civil works are included in, in, the, uh, in the existing intersection improvements on County Road 169, but significantly higher, well into just sub 400,000, um, previously tendered at 525. So you can see that um, there, there are some examples as well from Collingwood. So the Collingwood had done um, two of the very similar projects. One was an upgrade to a bit of a, an enhanced level B of a, of a pedestrian crossover. Um, that from brand new was 78,000. And, uh, and I think the other one there was 140,000 and that was a mid block IPS. Those are figures fairly recent from Tatham Engineering who was their design consultant. Amber Betsworth. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> although this is my last meeting and I don't have any ongoing after this um, responsibility for this, I must say that th the charges for that second option uh, are, are really high. However, uh, I believe the mayor and whoever replaces me here is going to have this as an ongoing issue 
and it's going to haunt me in my memory uh, even after I have left. So uh, I think to fix it properly, I would be in favor of lights. Uh, member Taylor and then Member Burkett. So oh, Derek, are you saying which intersections does this 180 cover? Just to recap, is it three intersections or, or where is it? No, sorry, uh, if there's some confusion there, that's each site. So we are recommending the PXO upgrades at both sites. That's the cold water at Mill and the, uh, the Division Road at Gillum. Um, however, I, I believe the IPS is, is definitely not warranted at the mill. The, the one at the mill operates pretty good. The compliance is, is relatively good. Um, the enhancements actually uh, make a lot of sense in terms of we have a lot of flowers and decorative things um, on the peripheral of the road allowance in the downtown core of coal water and, and bringing that road users focus overhead is going to uh, pre prepare much better visibility for those infrastructures. Uh, so this is per each location. If council was to direct us on both uh, to do IPS, uh, then it would be 100 and, uh, 170 times two. <clears throat> Taylor? Yeah, we're just in closing and uh, I, I haven't felt the, the grief from Marchmount, but I appreciate what the mayor and Councillor Bessworth, but I think the enhanced one in Coldwater makes sense that you would see it there and then maybe we go one at a time for Marchmount. And this, we've gone above and beyond in Marchmount and we don't <laughs> want any accidents there. So I would concur uh, with uh, doing it in Marchmount and then doing the enhanced in Coldwater. Thank you. Uh, member Burkett and then Member Cox. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Derek, you know as well as I do, the lights that are now at, at, at Marchmount Crossing do not work. And I can't see the added lights that we've that you've proposed working only because you still won't be able to see them flashing when the sun's shining on them. And, and we've seen videos of cars going right through the intersection. Like I, I would support the traffic lights the, in the last uh, slide that you showed us. I think that one will work at Marchmount and what member Taylor is saying to put the enhanced ones in cold water because Gray Street isn't anywhere as busy as, as Division Road. And our struggle is the amount of traffic that, that Division Road uh, has is what we're dealing with. Sorry, did you say Gray Street, <laughs> Member Burkett? Main isn't Street. it the one? Main, isn't water road. You, mean, me? you mean Main Street, right? By the library. Yeah. Did you, oh, you want the one by the library? What about the, Derek talked about the one at the school though. Did you not, Derek? At, well, that's at, where I think you're confused. Okay, I'm Derek? confused then. I thought you were talking about the one at the school. <clears throat> right, through, through the chair, there, there actually is no um, pedestrian crossover at the school. Um, definitely at a staff level, we're considering it, but knowing you know our challenges and tribulations with the current one, um, we're, we're trying to get a design that works. Um, but for sure, we, we would, you know, as a road authority, look to a future project, but that's not what's being considered here. Okay, thank you. My apologies. That's, we just want to make sure it's clear, that's all. Um, Member Cox, you had a comment? Yes, please. Through the chair to Derek. So Derek, at, in cold water, if we put the extended arms out and make sure that that parking, those parking spots are totally crisscrossed yeah. and then trim the trees a bit and make sure we have no excessive signage and things. We should be fine there with that one. If we take those lights out at Marchmount, are they reusable? Uh, through the chair, they them. certainly are. Um, and that is a benefit to these types of installations. They're solar powered. Um, they really only require some minor infrastructure. Uh, we created these sites to begin with at about only uh, $15,000 total. Yeah. Um, so there, there's certainly a, um, a, you know, a cost-effective way to manage pedestrian crossings, and uh, and we'll be seeking new locations through our transportation master plan. Yeah, I wondered if that was one that I thought we would. Uh, we were looking at uh, Severn Shores, or not? Was we? Oh, through the chair, Severn Shores has been created. Yeah, but so they've got their lights. There. Yep. Okay, so then we still have one left. Okay, thanks. Okay, so okay, Member Paquette. Sorry, through you, Madam Chair. So if council finds in favor of putting the, the lights up, the amber, red, and green light, the time frame to have them installed there, do you have any idea? Uh, through the chair, so this one's gonna be a bit more difficult to peg um, a timing on. Lead times on our current infrastructure project, which was tendered in December, um, have the uh, a delay of all the way to middle of July. 
uh, when we requested it to be completed in May. So the lead times on product is, is causing a very uh, significant delay in a lot of infrastructure projects, specifically signals. Um, so I, I do envision this being you know, delayed well into the start of school for next year, um, i.e. The, the fall 2022 um, at a minimum. So you will not see you know, new infrastructure there for the start of the school year. I think as long as they know it's coming in, they understand that it's out of our hands to control times. But um, so with this cost of, cost of what this is going to be, I look forward to Andrew Plunkett bringing forward our surplus and possibly we'd be able to take some out of there. So um, I, I don't know when, I don't know if I can ask this, Allison, when is Andrew going to bring forward our surplus? Just, just we need this money. So where are we going to get it from? There you go. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll chime in uh, for the chair. I expect the auditor should be finished soon. Uh, I don't want to bring the number forward until they're they're done, just in case. Correct. We and we do temporarily have a surplus. Certainly, uh, quite uh, capable of covering this amount uh, without much issue. Okay, thanks for that information. It's just uh, was member Betsworth and then member Briquette and then member Cox. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like then, if I could, to bring forth a motion uh, for approval uh, on installing lights at Marchmont and Gillum Road. Well, just We'll just wait and see what Andrea or Allison has there, but a uh, member Briquette and member Cox. Thank you. Through <coughs> you, Madam Chair, to Derek. Just could you just walk through when we, if council votes in favor of the lights, Derek, what needs to be happened? We're not putting a set of lights at Gillum. So we're basically, from what I've seen in the diagram, we're putting two poles with two lights and we have to run power to them. Is that correct? Yep, that's, that's about it. Through the chair is, uh, so it would be actually four heads. Um, six in total because there's the little man flashing signs as well. Um, power supply, traffic cabinet, some uh, conduit crossing, bores, stuff like that. Um, we can reuse the existing pads. So we have two, um, uh, you know, pedestrian pads, a concrete padway with truncated dome uh, crossings. And, uh, and so, yeah, there would be a little bit of work there, but I, I think the, the overall scope would be limited in the fact that we already have a pedestrian crossing there. So hopefully the 180 that we've estimated is on the conservative side, um, but uh, we would need to complete a design, obtain power supply, issue a tender, and, uh, and have the contractor get supply material. Supplementary, Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, to Derek, through you, Madam Chair, to Derek. So is this again has to go back to Tatham's and do we have to wait months for them to come back with, with their recommendation or is there something that we can do from our side to speed it up? Uh, no, through the chair. So the warrant analysis um, is being bypassed in this instance. So council has chosen a, an infrastructure set without design uh, or without warrant, um, but you still need a design. So the topographic survey is already completed. Um, Tatham's well engaged already. So that will streamline uh, the conversion from what we have been working towards to uh, a mid block or an IPS. Thank you. Amber Cox. Yeah, that was part of my question what the um, member Briquette had talked but I was also you had said that they already did that one in Collingwood so they would be well versed and have possibly something ready to roll pretty quick compared to just being out of the cold on it yes absolutely it's a so IPSs are common throughout the entire province any transportation engineer will definitely I mean the one at Marchmount yeah that's right that changeover right okay and the and the other one was oh never mind I'll ask you later it's okay so uh, through to oh, I know. go ahead, Member Cox. Sorry, thank you. Um, if, if you put an order in or put out right now, like I know you said you have to put out an RFP, but what about the equipment part of it? You said you talked to Guild. Is there something that you could do to say, we this is what we need? And, and I mean, are they all not cost the same price or is it like looking at Sears compared to somebody else? Like, I mean, I understand the contracting and the building part is, is, a, is a RFP, but I would think that the equipment itself that you're saying the infrastructure is what takes so long, if it could be ordered 
then that could be added into the cost or is that something we can't do? Through, through the chair, no, we certainly can. Um, staff have a procurement policy to oh. abide by. And uh, what we would seek if, if you're looking for, um, you know, an existing contractor to be issued a contemplated change order uh, to streamline, you know, obtaining product really, um, we can do that. I think maybe adding a part to the motion that says that this, uh, that this work be, you know, offered to Guild in a contemplated change order. If we find that the prices are unreasonable, we don't have to go with it. But, um, but if you gave us permission to, to bypass the procurement bylaw, uh, then certainly we could do that. I would I would like to do that just because let's get this rolling and maybe even if it was like the middle of September, it's better than October, November. Thank you. So through to Derek, uh, so we're changing the lights and everything's going on there. What about markings on the pavement? Through the chair. Uh, so pavement marking uh, program has uh, is actually a little bit over budget and we have a contractor, it's called Stone, Stone Pavement Markings. And uh, we're working with them to uh, evaluate individual lines that uh, may not require uh, refreshing this year to keep within budget. So that's actively being done this week. And, uh, and I believe the contractor would like to start in the middle part of June. Uh, so it's a little more delayed than we typically like to see, but once again, um, pricing put us out, uh, out of line a little bit and we're looking some ways to pull back uh, and reach that maximum budget limit. Okay, because I know that was uh... A lot of comments coming back on that. Was it enough? Sure. Did, but, okay. Okay. So we'll have Allison read this motion. And oh, Member McIntyre. Uh, through the chair, uh, I guess possibly to Derek. I was going to bring up the markings. Uh, you and I had a discussion last week about the markings of the crosswalk in Moshegel. Uh, I'd hold my hand up very high for that uh, reusable equipment. Why we wouldn't put that in Moshegel is uh, something I wouldn't understand. I am in favor of as. Um, Member Cox and Member Betsworth have uh, pointed out about the lights there. I think we're pretty much all in agreement with that. But I would like the markings to be put in Wachego as soon as possible because there's it's really faint. You can't see anything at about a crosswalk. And I'll hold my hand up high for the reusable uh, from Marchmont that uh, would fit nicely in Wachego. Thank you. So is that something that could happen this year, Derek? The lights and we because we were up there in the weekend and the markings on the street are bad but yeah. i understand you're coming through and changing so yeah through through the chair pavement marking is an annual thing so we're not delayed in any other way other than we're over budget um and we're working with the contractor to scope down and so yeah the, the pavement markings are every year we paint them so okay we again this year yeah. thank you so alice <laughs> if you'd like to read a motion and we'll see what happens here Okay, um, I'm just going to need um, director's help for this. So the last line to be added is further that the work be sole source to. Thank you. I don't know who <laughs> I don't know who we were talking about there. At Guild Electric. So, um, and. So. Is this all of the work, um, Derek, or is it just a portion of the work? Uh, it would just be a portion of the work. Um, okay, so that portion, and which portion? Uh, Division Road, Jill. Okay, we'll start with this, and I believe the wording for the change in lighting is just IPS, Derek? Uh, yes, it's an IPS. Okay. So <laughs> motion motion then reads that public works report number W22-020 dated May 25th, 2022, with respect to the pedestrian crossover upgrades be received. And further that staff be directed to proceed with the upgrades to IPS for the Division Road and Gillum Road um, PXO in Marchmont, and further the staff be directed to proceed with the upgrades to enhance PXO to pipe two level B plus for the Coldwater Road and Mill Street PXO in Coldwater, and further that the budgets, budget deficiencies be funded by the Capital Reserve Fund, and further that a portion of the work be sole sourced to Guild Electric via change order. So I just question where you're taking that from if 
It's coming out of reserves that once again, there's so an- if, if, if I can uh, respond uh, to the chair, the surplus gets transferred to the capital reserve. Okay. So we can't actually take it from the surplus because the surplus no longer exists once the uh, once it's transferred to the reserves. Okay. I just I just hate keeps and taking money out of there. But if we're moving money in there after we hear back from you, that's that's great. Okay. I need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Member Betsworth, second by Member Cox. All in favor. And that's carried. Okay. So now we go on to administration report. A22016, Bill 27. Allison. Madam Chair, I'm gonna to apologize to Michelle here for a second here. Um, because uh, our chief building official has to leave by 10 o'clock, I was wondering if we could do the property standards um, clean and F3 clear bylaws four. before he has to leave us. So that would be F3.4. And okay. I apologize for the last minute change. We just kind of found that out, so. Hi, Michelle. We'll just put you on hold for a minute. Okay, Cody, if you'd like to go ahead with F34. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Perfect. There we go. Um, good morning again. So um, my report today is, is in regards to the property standards and clean and clear bylaw. Um, on December 8th, 2021, Corporate Services Committee received report uh, number A21-045, uh, which provided a list of good neighbor bylaws to prioritize, um, review and create these bylaws. Um, saying things such as noise, uh, reevaluating our parking bylaw, those sort of things. So um, property standards and clean and clear were included in that list. So that's why I'm here today to, to speak on those. Um, both of these bylaws were previously written in 2004 for the Township of Severn. So um, staff took the initiative of rewriting and creating these bylaws um, just to um, reflect the general concerns that we're dealing with today um, to make sure that the bylaws both suit um, our residents and the issues again that are, are coming up now um, rather than how the bylaw was written in 2004. So I'm going to start with, with a brief um, explanation of how the property standards bylaw generally works, what it um, will kind of cover and uh, a little bit of details of the process of, of going through a property standards order. Um, so the property standards bylaw is enforced and enacted through the Ontario Building Code Act. Um, a property standards bylaw regulates uh, complaints such as bed bugs, mold, unfinished siding on a dwelling, interior and exterior building standards, um, including structural soundness. So making sure that um, again, if a house has no siding on it and, and we receive a complaint, that is something we, we actively enforce. Um, an order through property standards is typically a minimum deadline of 30 days. It is a, a longer process to, to go through um, rather than clean and clear. The property owner, um, if issued an order, does have the ability to appeal to the property standards committee. They have 14 days from when the order was served it, initially. They have 14 days to decide if they would like to appeal it and then go through that process. Um, the property standards committee can overturn the order, amend the order and or extend deadlines for compliance. If that property owner is looking for um, 60 days, 90 days to complete the work, that is something that a, the property standards committee can agree on and um, in fact, um, move forward with and allow if if the a decision by the property standards committee cannot be appealed to council it has to go to the courts so if they do appeal it to the committee um and it gets appealed again it, we, we would have to take it to the courts at that point it doesn't come to to council to discuss um the biggest thing we're, we're seeing with property standards is that the over the years the landlord and tenant board has kind of backed off of the enforcement side of things and what they're really dealing with um, between landlords and tenants 
and it, they're putting the onus onto the municipality. So again, things like bed bugs, mold, those sort of things used to be dealt with the landlord and tenant board. Um, however, now they're no longer speaking to those matters and townships are having to deal with those issues as they do fall under property standards. Um, we do see quite, we have seen quite a few um, very big scenarios of, of and drastic scenarios with bed bugs and, and mold and whatnot. So it, it, it is frequently going on in Severn and a very high um, complaint volume to, to the township. So if, if the township has to undertake any other enforcement or work to bring a property into compliance. So um, again, it's it's the easy example is is siding on a house. If if they fail to comply by that thirty day deadline, the I would personally go in and do a reinspection to see whether or not the work was completed. If it's not completed at that point, the township would overtake that order and and. Um, essentially hire a third party contractor to complete that work to bring the property into compliance. Um, the property owner is then invoiced accordingly for that cost to do so. Um, should they fail to pay the invoice, the amount is added to the tax account for the property. Only invoice works under property standards will survive tax sale. Whereas clean and clear does not survive tax sale. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Property standards is a little bit, um, again, more of a longer process to go through, dealing with um, bigger issues and scenarios, whereas clean and clear is typically um, a quick fix. And, and if, you know, a shorter timeline of maybe two, three days, whereas again, property standards, you're looking at a minimum of 30 for an order, possibly longer, depending on if it's appealed and, and what the um, property standards committee agrees to. Um, furthermore, to, to property standards, um, staff is, is coming forward with a, the appointment of building inspectors under this bylaw as property standards officers. Sorry. Um, sorry. Nope. So the, I think the, the biggest reasons for this is um, building inspectors already work with the building code hand in hand when they're doing their inspections. However, there is scenarios where um, if they are attending properties and they're there for um, additions or expansions to, to houses and they see there's other structurally sound issues with the property already, with the, the dwelling, um, that is something that we, we believe could speed a process up of having them being able to visit those issues on site and then bring it back to me. I would still be doing um, the majority of the heavy lifting. It would also be um, in ever the absence of me being away, um, the, the, prob the possibility of having a building inspector to go out and do those um, quick inspections, photos, that kind of stuff, just so um, those complaints can keep moving forward and they don't have to necessarily always wait for me to be back. Um, I, I just think it's a good tool for the building inspectors to have being able to, again, look at those issues, um, not necessarily always um, seeking them, but when they are doing an inspection, if there is something that uh, is a huge health and safety concern um, and, and should be addressed you know, sooner rather than later, them having those tools to be able to address it right then and there um, in coordination with me as well um, is, is just a tool we're looking to, to kind of add for enforcement purposes. So there are um, some kind of areas of, of noted change than, than just regular housekeeping um, changes in the new property standards bylaw. Um, definitions where there is a cross-reference now aligned with the zoning bylaw. So we made sure that our definitions meet exactly what our zoning bylaw says so that there is no misinterpretation or um, misunderstanding of what exactly the definition is. Um, for example, derelict vehicles, that kind of stuff, zoning. Um, we want to make sure that we match the building code and zoning as they both play significant factors in a property standards bylaw. 
um, as well as just making sure, again, that we aren't missing something in a definition in a bylaw that zoning has, and then we misinterpret what the definition is going to be. Um, we had to update the definition of derelict vehicles since there is now um, no requirement for valid stickers on plates. That was a major um, factor in derelict vehicles beforehand. If, if your plates were expired, then that vehicle <laughs> technically couldn't be driven on, on a um, roadway and therefore was deemed derelict. However, with them not using the stickers anymore, we had to recreate our definition to fit um, again, more inoperable now. So if there's no mortar in it, it can't operate, it can't drive. Um, those are the kind of standards we'll be looking at now um, as we can't use the plate to um, deem a vehicle derelict anymore. As well as stockpiling of fill, we do sometimes see um, small scales of, you know, one, two loads maybe dumped on a property and then um, unfortunately, something might happen. The work's not done within, you know, maybe three to six months and, and it just stockpiles on the property. Um, we, I think for, again, aesthetics and, and just making sure that it doesn't keep backsliding and, you know, growing weeds, grass, that sort of thing, that having something in our property standards bylaw um, with a, you know, a, an uncut covered in unleveled state is, is our biggest thing. Just making sure that if people are bringing it, that is totally fine, but it, it shouldn't stay um, uncovered or unleveled for you know years on end. It, it should be done within a reasonable time. Uh, Cody, excuse me just for a second. Do you wanna take questions as we go along? Sure, yes, please. Okay. Member Briquette. Thank you through Madam Chair to Cody. So stockpiling of fill, how many actual complaints have we had, Cody? And the only reason I'm asking, I'll give you an example. What do you do with Dunlops, the old Dunlops building now that I see a berm all around it? And if you go up Highway 12, across from Sunset Crescent, they've bermed that as well. That's all berm. So how do you differentiate between stockpiling of fill and what you see of berms? Yeah. Through the chair, oh, Cody or Allison, whoever can speak to that. We Cody can let spoke. Allison speak first. <laughs> okay, so um, some of these sites may be subject. And I might ask the director of planning to jump in here. Some of these sites might be subject to building permits, and these might be on their. Um, oh my gosh, I'm gapping on the word um, on their site plans. So if they're defined on their site plan, they're subject to a building permit or a fill permit. Um, then they would be excluded from this section of the bylaw. So, and I think that's important to note. So if they're covered off in that or a development plan or something along those lines, such as we've got the houses that are just down the street from the municipal office on Burnside, similar thing, they've got berms around them. So if that's detailed on their um, building permit and related plans, and that's been approved by planning and building, that would be excluded from this section of the bylaw. Okay, Member Burkett, you had a comment? Supplementary through you, Madam Chair. Well, we're now we're gonna pick and choose, and I don't agree with this one of stockpiling and fill. And I'll give you another example. Previous counselor that sat between 2010 and 14, Mr. Ferguson, had his whole property burned. Actually had the quarry come in and burn his whole property along Cambrian Road. What do we do with that? Like, I don't feel this, like I'm in agreement with what Cody has brought forward now, but maybe this question, Cody, how many complaints have you had about people that have had one or two loads in their in their driveway or in their yard and, and not leveled? Yes, through the chair. Um, I've had a couple, not, not too, too many, not a, a large amount of complaints. Um, however, it has come across um, several times for again, the, the um, not necessarily the berms, but it's a residential property. They have um, you know one or two loads of fill placed on their front yard and now the weeds are starting to grow through it. I think it's more so eventually um, a question of what's the fill there for? What's, what's it for the purpose on the property and why hasn't it been um, necessarily leveled within a reasonable time, right? That, I think that's the biggest piece of, um, you know, if you brought it today, we're not looking to, you have to have it spread today. It's more, if you exceed, if you bring it in and then three years later decide to finally 
um, level it, it's it's gonna eventually more than likely maybe bring some complaints from from residents. Complimentary, Madam Chair, through you, if I made a Cody. Okay, so if we could change it to say within settlement areas, I'm happy to do that. But if we're going to do it township wide, I don't feel that is appropriate. And I, I remind council the previous noise bylaw and some of the challenges we had with that. Like I can understand not stockpiling fill in, in our settlement app areas, absolutely. But when you're out in the country, I don't think we need to extend it to the whole township. Allison. Just my thoughts. I don't know um, how the other members of council feel. If that is the way council is looking, then maybe we could tie it to the zone. Um, so if we could tie it to the residential or shoreline residential zone, that would be great. Um, that would exclude your rural and your farm properties and your agricultural properties. Um, it's just that we have residential development outside of the settlement settlement areas. I wouldn't want to exclude those either. So, so but can so can you put a time limit on it then? So, with respect to okay, so with the way the bylaw reads is that Phil cannot remain in an unleveled state. I believe it's for forty five days and uncovered for sixty. So, I think that should be in there. Well, that is in the bylaw. We're just giving you a summary in the bylaw. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. But... Member Briquette, sorry, I was just looking at that. Other... Madam Chair, I'm still struggling with this because we have people that live out in the country that may may have a load of gravel that's not bothering anyone. They don't have any neighbors within, you know, miles apart. And now we're going to place a bylaw township wide which I, and again, I go back to what we did with the noise bylaw. I can absolutely see it within our settlement areas or what Madam Clerk has spoken to, some of the, the areas that may be residential that have 20 or 30 homes in it. Yes, I understand that wholeheartedly, but I don't think we should do it township wide. We've got farm farmers that, that stockpile for whatever reason, and I, I just don't want to think that they should be penalized for what they're trying to do within their own uh, working world. No I, I would agree with Member Briquette. It's farmers stockpile different things for different reasons. They may bring a load of gravel in and not use it all this year, but they need it in the spring. And the same with dirt. They, I don't know. I think we should okay. limit it. No problem. Like staff work at council's service level they wish to set. So if council would like to refine this to, I would, again, I would suggest residential and shoreline residential zones then uh, that would be an appropriate teller because it would automatically exclude all your farms and rural properties and things like that. Okay, Member uh, Cox, you had a comment? Through the, <clears throat> through the chair to Allison or Cody, so far we're at page five and, and it seems to me that I hear how busy everyone is and yet now we're going to do all these new things and have more busy. And the other one I see is that if this gets put on social media or people find out, you are now gonna pit a neighbor against a neighbor and maybe someone who doesn't like a neighbor and this whole siding and all the other things and our building inspectors are busy, busy. And all I hear is how busy and I'm not being mean. It's just, I think that we're like really delving into areas that to me and i know there's already in there already but the extra ones and i and i'm finding look i mean we've already talked about bylaw for the weekends and uh i just think that we receive a complaint and now you're going to have to go look at that and i know that then the building inspectors are going to be out and then they tell cody and then we do this and now there's more paperwork um i'm just not really keen on this let's do more sometimes and find more than we are already doing right now well i find we're getting more complaints and if we don't have some kind of a property standards bylaw we we have no teeth to do anything but we Absolutely. do have a property standards bylaw but we're refining it allison you have a comment Thanks. Just for a point of clarification, so if council would like us to scrap the stockpiling of fill section, it's a small part of a much larger bylaw and staff are pleased to do that. Um, 
I should note that it does not exclude people from still having to apply to the general fill bylaw and fill permits process um, for larger loads and things like that. That is also subject to review right now with the director of public works and the third party consultant that has been approved a couple months back. Um, so staff are quite happy. If you would like to just remove this section, staff will do as council wishes. Um, with respect to property standards bylaws, we have one in place right now. A good chunk of what's before you today is updated language of what is already existing. Um, staff are just trying to highlight a couple sections um, that we've updated in particular to reflect changes in what has happened provincially or um, issues that we are particularly finding a struggle. So the next one being exterior walls clear definition of what an acceptable building finish is. This is a real struggle with our current property standards bylaw that lacks a proper definition. So, and we have issues where people come back and challenge us and say, well, you're telling me tie par is not an acceptable exterior finish for my house. We're like, yes, it's not meant to be a permanent exterior finish for your house. Well, it doesn't say that in your bylaw. Okay. So that's some of the updates we're trying to do is to just tighten some of those holes up. Um, it is probably the single biggest exercise that we went down with this bylaw is tightening up holes that exist in our current one and updating the language to match what is currently consistent across most municipalities. So there aren't actually huge amounts of new sections. It looks really different because it's been reformatted and some of the language has been cleaned up. Um, but in general standards, um, we've had a property standards for years bylaw and we're just looking to update the bulk of this we've pulled out pieces because we want council's direction on a few items in particular the next one um but if council doesn't want us in the bill in the business of dealing with the minor stockpiling of fill then we are happy to not do that okay member burkett had a question here all through the through you madam chair no I what you stated, Madam Clerk, I'm, I'm happy to support within our settlement areas. Like, I don't think we should have fill when you've got house beside house beside house. Like, I'm happy to support that. I just don't want it township wide. Okay, on to the next then. Cody, continue. Perfect, thank you. Um, so Allison went over the, the exterior <laughs> walls. Um, and then signs, there's new requirements that they uh, that they be maintained without visible deterioration. So um, again, a sign that's, you know, falling apart, broken, that sort of thing, it, it needs to be um, well-maintained um, and in, in working condition. And then property standards. Um, so this is, this is one that um, through staff's kind of research, we found most municipalities are starting to get into. Um, and, and we um, staff were, uh, um, were kind of looking for, again, a discussion of whether um, we think this is something that Severn should be also moving forward with, um, and that is recreational facilities. Um, and the equipment used in these facilities, um, for example, gyms, yoga studios, those sort of things. Um, again, it's it's something that we're finding in, in our research. Um, most municipalities are moving into actively including in their property standards bylaw. Um, it's not currently enforced within Severn, but however, as I said, it, it, is, it is coming up more frequently. Um, it would obviously, it's a brand new, so it would increase the, the complaint volume that, that we're already receiving. Um, and, and just wondering, does the committee want this section in the draft per se? Member Paquette. Thank you through Madam Chair. So Cody, could, could you just explain what exactly you would be doing at a gym or a yoga studio? Like what complaints are you getting? Um, so again, it's not something we actively do. So it would be something if if we um, a, a gym is is open and all the equipment is either um, dismantled, broken, um, you know, needs to be repaired per se um, for the purpose of that recreational facility. Is is my understanding that that's what other municipalities are are getting into is um, making sure that the um, equipment and also obviously the, the structural soundness of the building for 
the use of that facility is meeting the, the proper standards of being able to um, properly function. Well, I don't well, like the idea of us being in there. Remember, sorry, Madam, go ahead. So sorry, Madam Chair, I didn't hear what you said. Sorry, what was that? I don't think that we as a township need to be in a private recreation facility. If I don't like that private recreation facility, I'll move on to another one. I think we're getting too personable here. That's that's a private business you're talking about, is it not, Cody? Yes, it would obviously be the same standard for, for all of our facilities as well. Um, but yes, it would be if, as, as you said, if someone makes a complaint about the, um, the the business again for example we use a gym um for the equipment and and everything inside um as i said it, it seems to be something that other municipalities are moving into um and and therefore we included it but wanted to see kind of direction on on that section i would like to see that one removed but member briquette and then member cox through you, Madam Chair, absolutely. I don't know what we're doing in this section at all. We're not qualified to see whether equipment is meets the standard. There's a whole government agency that if something does get hurt on a piece of equipment, they'll call in workman's comp. I don't think we should be delving into something we know little about. Member Cox. Yeah, through the chair. And I thought that uh, municipal facilities and areas were not underneath the bylaw. Cody or Allison, could you answer that question, please? Yes, Cody. through the chair. Um, sorry, you are right. Yes, sorry, that's that's my mistake there. Um, we yes, we are essentially exempt. Yeah. Um, but Thank obviously, you. if if this was something, then then we would want to make sure that we are maintaining um, our stuff as well. Yeah, you know, I I I don't think it should be here. I think that's just not something we we need to be into. I, I can't see Mark and um, yeah, Steve. I was so. trying to speak to on that one. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mark, I can't see you in there. Okay, go ahead. Just yeah, speak I, up, I, I can't see you. I think this is an overreach and you know, we got enough, uh, as Councillor Cox was saying, we got enough to do. Let's, let's refine what we've got. And this is, this is crazy. So uh, yep. throw this one out. Allison. Duly noted, so that's why this was brought forward to council. It's it's one of those ones where staff really are fine either way. We're just looking for direction. So if council would like this removed, then staff are happy to do so. Okay, I think we're all into, I can't see Jim or Ron. You guys in or out of this one? Can you see them, Allison? I, I think, can scroll I agree. down I and- Through the chair, I don't, I don't think it's necessary for us to get into other people's business at this moment. Yeah. Okay. And I can't see Ron. I. Oh, Ron, you need to unmute yourself and then you'll pop up. Well, I think so far we're all. Oh, out there's of John. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I'll leave it alone. Yes. Oh, I heard Ron say yes. Okay. <laughs> that one's out. Okay. Cody, we're back to new section of for Severin. Perfect. Um, thank you. So, so now we'll move into kind of an overview of what our clean and clear bylaw. Um, again, not too much has changed, just more so um, bringing it into kind of what we're seeing today, uh, complaint wise, as again, the bylaw was written in 2004. Um, so clean and clear bylaws um, are enforced and enacted through the Municipal Act. So that's where kind of the difference between property standards and clean and clear really comes in. Um, the clean and clear bylaw does not have a committee to appeal to. Um, so if if they, um, it's it's just a lot quicker process. It's, it, it'll cover things more like long grass, um, you know, noxious weeds, that kind of stuff. Um, those timelines to have something corrected like that are typically, you know, 48, 72 hours two, three days, um, whereas property standards, you're looking at something probably more significant with a, a dwelling siding, um, and you have to give an appropriate timeline to let the, the resident um, and property owner fix those those issues, whereas cutting grass, you, you shouldn't need 30 days to, to do that sort of thing to maintain um, your grass, and something like two, three days is, is more appropriate. 
Um, the timelines through Clean and Clear are a lot shorter typically, um, but depending on um, Clean and Clear will still cover things like domestic and industrial waste. So if someone has car parts on their property, um, again, derelict vehicles fall under both property standards and Clean and Clear. Um, if we're dealing with one derelict vehicle and some car parts, yes, they can be given 30 days to bring the vehicle either into compliance or have it removed. Um, however, again, most of the clean and clear is gonna deal with uh, you know, garbage on the front yard, that sort of thing. Um, 30 days is an excessive amount of time to have that you know, sort of stuff dealt with, um, where if, if we give them say a week to deal with it, um, it's just a lot quicker process compared to property standards. Um, under Clean and Clear, we're kind of proposing a new long grass standards. So on, in residential zones, uh, the maximum height would be 15 centimeters. Um, anything over that would, you could have, you know, I could show up and, and ask for it to be cut. And then all other zones would be 30 centimeters. So again, your, your farmers and whatnot aren't going to have to um, keep grass maintained to the same level as residential standards. Um, where we do see our, our biggest call volume for long grass is in residential zones to begin with. Um, and, and again, is a quick, you know, two, three days kind of turnaround of, of needing that to be cut and dealt with. Um, as well as um, we're looking to um, something as simple as like the stockpiling of wood. Um, we, we do have frequently get some complaints of wood being um, kind of just not properly stored, not kept um, stored and, and nice on a property. It's just thrown all around. Um, those calls do frequently come in and have increased over the past two, three years. So it, it is something that we're looking to bring in just to, again, uh, you know, you have a week to to properly stockpile your wood, um, that kind of stuff. It okay, does I, not understand, allow to... I understand Mike has his, sorry, Cody, Mike has oh, his hand okay. up, but I, if I don't call your name, I can't see you on my screen. So just speak up. Uh, Member Baquette. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm struggling with this as well. Again, Cody, you have far too much to do. And we have two bylaw enforcement officers that are ticketing people in cold water, causing us, myself, grief. And I'm struggling with yes. that. And now you're bringing forward something else. Like, I don't agree in the country. We can't even keep our, our roadways under 30 centimeters. I've got to go out with my whippersnipper and cut some of the intersections because it's too long. I'm happy to support this if we're going to do it in settlement areas. Yes, I understand that wholeheartedly. Not township wide. I can't support it. I'm sorry. Uh, Allison and then Member Cox. Um, so just in comment to uh, Member Burkett's remarks, um, right now we do have restrictions on long grass, but we don't have any height restriction in there. Um, which is tricky to do enforcement with. Enforcement likes rules, um, courts likes rules. Um, so if we wanted to, we could put it, we're on residential zone properties, the maximum height is 15 centimeters. All other zones are, I, I would suggest and strongly recommend we do have some height level. It could be two feet if that's what council would like, no, no. where it's something like that. And the reason why I suggest that is, no. is that we respond and again these are all responded to on a complaint basis so if we get a complaint it's probably gotten pretty long um and a lot of people will say is well well what's your rule what do i have to get to what do i have to monitor to what do i have to do this so it's as much being able to provide people with guidance again staff completely go by what council chooses us to do so if council would like us to just focus on residential zones then we can do that um, and we would strike the second line. So, so it, is it more residential you're hearing from? Through Cody? the chair. Um, it is a mix of both. Um, it, it typically um, more so, yes, residential, but however, we do get um, frequent calls of, you know, vacant properties around the township and the grass is just grown way too long. 
Um, so it's not only residential zones that we get those calls from. Um, we, we have had to deal with um, development properties that had long grass and noxious weeds growing throughout the whole thing. Um, and it was several acres big um, in size. So we, we do get a mixture. However, the majority of them would be residential, yes. Member Cox and then Member Briquette. How about stockpiling of skids? Do we have anything for that? No, we through the chair. No, currently we don't. We don't. Well, I would think that that would be a little bit more something we'd worry about because of the fact of fire too. Um, but uh, anyway, the other one I have is that this is becoming a sad state that we were having this many complaints that we have to measure and figure out what's going on. People have to understand that we're a rural community. And I get that you wanna go down the road and have everything immaculate, but we live in the country. And I get that in your residential settlement areas, you can do it. But I just can't believe that we're getting that many complaints of people are being this ridiculous over long grass out on a country road. Sorry, but I just, it, it just amazes me. Member Paquette. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can't support something out township wide. I'm happy to support grass and the length of it within our settlement areas. And further to member Cox's comments, we have someone on the 400 that has a pile of skids yep. and the smoke that comes out of that stove that he has that, that blocks the highway and we can't do anything about it. And that's, that's a safety hazard. I'm not sure, like, and I appreciate what staff is trying to do, but I think we're opening a Pandora's box. And I go back to when we had the noise bylaw and what happened there, and we had to bring it back to fix it. Like, I can't support this the way it's written. Happy to support it in a settlement area, but not outside that. It can't be township wide. Those are my comments. I agree. That's fine. Here. Member Taylor. Yeah. Member Taylor. A question to Cody through the chair. So where did the 15 centimeters come from? Like that's six inches. Is that is that typical? Because I can see like a vacant lot, six inches doesn't seem too bad to me in a in a settlement area. Yes, through the chair. Um, those standards, the the 15 and and 30 centimeters, um, again were numbers that we um, found when we did our research for other municipalities clean and clear bylaws. Um, neighboring municipalities, those were the numbers that they um, kind of across the board were using. So they were the ones that we thought we would implement as well. Yeah, and just to follow up uh, through the chair, I would agree with the what member Burkett is saying that in 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 a built up area for sure, but uh, but I, I even question 15 centimeters. That doesn't seem like I think it can go a bit higher than that, in my opinion. So my only concern on that is 15 centimeters today you know how fast our grass is growing right now. If they go in and say, okay, you're 15 centimeters, by a week you're 18 to 20. Like we're cutting our grass twice a week right now. So I I don't know about that. Anyway, um, Allison, did you? Oh, member Burkett, then member through Cox. You, Madam, through you, Madam Chair. Again, I respect what staff is trying to do, but now we're going to go back to our residents and how they pile their wood like again, I can see it in a settlement area, but I can't see like, where are we going with this? We're gonna micromanage how people live within our township in the rural area. Like I'm struggling with this, I'm sorry. Like we're gonna open a Pandora's box that we don't wanna go down. We live in rural Ontario. If it's within a settlement area, absolutely. Everyone likes to keep their yards nice and clean, but not outside that. Like if there's, if there's garbage in the front yard, absolutely. But are we going to go in behind these homes and see what they're doing? Like, yeah. Again, like I can't, I can't support it the you way know, it's written. Corner property there that uh, it's a terrible mess. Hey, um, Member Betsworth, did I can't see you? So if you want to comment, okay, I was next. Sorry, um, just well, sorry. Member Cox, then, and then we'll go back to John Betsworth. And and the idea that Member Taylor brought forward to six inches—that is the whole theory of of the idea of don't mow in May and, and make sure that you keep your lawn at a certain height 
and it's better for your grass and and all the the new climate control and all those things like six inches is nothing i got six inches right now in my backyard probably i mowed it on the weekend so i agree that i i think maybe six inches isn't a big ordeal anywhere in my mind so my comment on that is six inches today but it's eight inches monday so then if you're going in and saying Friday, okay, it's six inches or eight inches, and we're giving them a week to do it. Anyway, Member Betsworth, did you have something to say? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to say, do we apply the same standard to ourselves? Uh, in other words, in our ditches, cattails no. and no. all of this kind of thing? No, I can tell you. Uh, Cody, through the uh, chair can I uh, a couple sorry yes. it's thank you um but the answer is no and um, the bylaws don't apply to us and we wouldn't have the manpower to do all of the ditches all the time I just wanted to circle back to a couple of things that I've heard um one to Councillor Cox you would be surprised at the complaints we got like this winter I got a complaint from a neighbor who thought their their neighbor had too much snow on their roof like particularly during COVID people have been uh, quite quite uh, engaged with their neighbors and if they didn't like their neighbor before and then they were home looking at them every day then they really don't like them so we we do get a surprising number of odd complaints um I, I think where this issue maybe is going is that um, council's hearing about our enforcement and we haven't done a lot of enforcement now, but you're getting some complaints about enforcement. But most of these bylaws, uh, we're enforcing parking, which is really what's causing the issues right now. These bylaws are all um, complaint driven. So we're not driving around and the students aren't driving around looking for long grass or, or looking for these kinds of issues, they will be complaint driven. So I think if you kind of put those two things together, and most of these things are not new, they've been there all the, the whole time, they're just trying to put some parameters around them. Member Briquette. Thank you through Madam Chair, but I still do not want it township wide. And I don't, I'd like to hear what other members have to say. Like I'm happy to support having grass cut within a settlement boundary area and keeping your homes nice if it's within a settlement boundary. And again, if it's out in the rural part and they've got junk in the front yard, absolutely. But I don't wanna see it township wide. Again, to, uh, I forget who said about our ditches, our ditches are not cut. I've had to go out and cut some of the long grass in our ditches because some of the residents are upset and I shouldn't tell you that. So if, we, if we're not going to do the same as a township, how can we expect our residents to, to comply with it? As I said, we we come up to stop signs that have three feet of grass, where you've got to nudge yourself forward to get around the stop sign to see if traffic's coming. So how is that fair? And now we're going to make our residents comply with grass cutting. Allison, can you answer that, please? Uh, so just generally reflecting on the conversations that are happening. So staff are fine to put in residential zone grass limits only if that's the direction council wants to go and same with the stockpiling of wood. Part of the reason we brought forward the stockpiling of wood piece in particular is that um, that we have had issues, again, near more residential areas where people have had wood dumped and they leave it most of the summer because they're busy doing other things. They're enjoying the water, they're entertaining and such like that. And they don't really need the wood till fall. So they don't really stockpile it till then. And over time, the grass has grown in around the wood because it hasn't been properly piled. And it's attracting little critters that like to live in the wood piles. So, um, and in a residential area that becomes a little more problematic because then they tend to find their way to the neighbors. Um, so if council would like to add a restriction on even the tidy stockpiling of wood to the residential zones, then that's fine by me as well. Again, this is entirely council's choice to set the service standard and standards that they wish in their municipality. We're just bringing forward the bylaws and bringing forward some general housekeeping updates to ensure that it's there. I do strongly recommend that we put a limit on how high grass can be in the residential area because 15 centimeters again to member Dunlop's uh, point, by the time we issue a letter and give them three to four days to comply, that could be significantly longer. Um, and if it's complaint driven, then clearly there's someone that it's bothering. So 
again, this and the prior bylaw are responded to on a complaint basis only. I did used to work for a place that did proactive enforcement, particularly on long grass. And we were out there mowing it all the time and billing people. And we don't want to be in that practice um, at all. But I do think it is helpful for residential standards to establish a limit as to what is acceptable. So I would be in a favor of keeping it, uh, like Member Buchanan has said, within settlement areas. Uh, and this is the bylaw. We can change it. If, if next year we're getting a lot of calls about out in, the, out in the country, then we can look at this again. But for right now, I think it's, it's mainly settlement areas because you're too, you're too close to your neighbor to put up with wood thrown all over or grass not being cut. Okay, so further to that, so what we will do in the draft is we will strike, if you're looking in the bylaw, it's uh, for clean and clear, it's 3.4. So we will strike the uh, restriction on grass heights for any other zone outside of residential areas. Um, and for 3.5, which currently reads, no person shall fail to keep the storage of wood on their land in a neat and organized manner. We'll just add in a residential zone, which will keep it Good. within a I certain think area. We, I think we'd all be in agreement to that. Yeah, uh, and my comment just on the, on the height, if we could make it 20 centimeters in the, uh, in the settlement areas so that's eight inches i leave that to council so we'll see right. what the committee thinks on that one through the chair can you see me um i can now you turned your mic on member mcintyre um i just um as mike uses the expression struggle i'm uh, struggling with the cottagers you know if they don't come up for a week their grass could be as um Member Taylor said could be up to 20 uh, centimeters. And I, I probably would agree with that more so than, we, we have a number of cottagers who, if they miss a week, their grass could be 15 to 20 centimeters tall before they get at it. So okay. I always worry about that as well. It's, it, it, provided it's complaint driven. Yeah. Um, you know, you're usually good neighbors and good friends and uh, the good neighbor policy. Nobody's going to complain, but if we're going to just have the the bylaw fellows running around saying, "Oh, that guy's at 10, 20 centimeters and it's clearly a cottage," yeah, I, I have a little problem with that. Yeah, I don't think they're going to get their measuring, just like you said, Jim. Yeah. It's, anyway, what uh, what's the consensus on that? We got to decide today. Or twenty well, centimeters. Twenty. I'm good with twenty. Twenty. I'm good with twenty. Okay. I'm not, but that's a consensus, so move on. Okay, Cody, slide eight. Perfect, thank you. Um, so again, under Clean and Clear, it doesn't allow any outdoor storage of domestic or industrial waste. Again, just reiterating the garbage, um, you know, car parts, that, that kind of stuff. Um, household garbage, um, if it is going to be kept outside, it should be in a proper container to do so. Um, it shouldn't just be, a, you know, on your, your driveway or in front of your garage. Um, if it's going to be fully stored outside, it should be in a container to keep any um, animals, that kind of stuff out of it. Um, again, clean and clear, there is no um, appeal committee as, as there is in property standards. So they um, tend to resolve a lot quicker. Again, if we're just dealing with long grass, garbage, that kind of stuff is, is a short timeline where again, property standards, we're looking at a minimum of 30 days. Um, and then again, if the township undertakes other enforcement, so we, we have to, a resident um, doesn't cut the grass within the, the appropriate time and we have to do it. Um, it is invoiced and then if not paid is added to the tax account. Um, however, clean and clear invoiced work does not survive tax sale whereas property standards does. Member Cox? Yeah, through the chair to Allison or Cody, could you please uh, do a note about those skid pilings and, and find out how the, if there's a fire or what there is and, and see how that works? Thank you. Absolutely. Cody, if you'd like to carry on with number nine then. If, I can't sure. see everybody, so if there's any other questions, just speak up. Okay. Perfect, so um, just the differences again between property standards and clean and clear. 
Um, clean and clear is a, a lot shorter timeline in property standards is, is again, a minimum of 30 days. And then um, property standards will survive tax sale where clean and clear does not. Um, and property standards has a appeal committee and clean and clear does not as well. Okay, welcome back everybody. Okay, um, Member Taylor. Yeah, just a question to you, Cody. I know you've got a couple of investigations ongoing, so I'm hoping that this doesn't uh, hamper the ones you've got going. And uh, uh, you're, if the ones you're working on now, will this new one have any effect on, on the ones you're working on now? So it's a twofold question there. Cody? Um, no, it won't because the investigation was being dealt with the current bylaw per se. Um, mm -hmm. So those proceedings at the time when, when the issues were um, brought to my attention or the complaint was made was the standard of the current one. So these new ones would not affect um, proceedings that are already um, in motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there's no more questions, Allison can read the motion, then we'll see if everything's okay. Okay, uh, the motion reads as follows, that administration report number A22-020 dated May 25th, 2022, regarding the property standards and clean and clear bylaws be received, and that the proposed property standards and clean and clear bylaws be approved as amended and further that the Township of Severn building inspectors be appointed as property standard officers and further that the required bylaws be brought forward to the next meeting of council. So does anybody want to know as admitted what they are or is you okay with this? I guess everybody's okay. I need to move her in a seconder, please. Moved by member Betsworth, second by member McIntyre. All in favor? Um, that's one no and that's carried. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cody, for your time. Appreciate that. Thank you. And if we can, then I would like a copy of the new one sent out to each of us, Allison. Is that okay? Yes. Once they're passed to council with the bylaw number and such, I'll be pleased to send them out. But again, I do remind council that these are bylaws that are dealt with purely on a complaint basis. Yeah. Unless we discover some like huge life safety issue and then we need to step in, but otherwise they are dealt with on a complaint basis so thank you very much okay uh we will go back now and we'll find <laughs> michelle michelle there you are hi so this is f31 we're back to administration report a22016 bill 27 welcome michelle uh, good morning, Member Chair and members of the committee. Um, this report is bill, to do with Bill 27, which was passed by the province of Ontario to amend the Employment Standards Act. Um, so our report here in policy is in compliance with the ESA, basically um, allowing employees to have time away from work, which I believe is not anything too out of the norm of what we have already. We just now actually have a policy that uh, outlines the process. So again, it would not re be reflective of emergency services or public works, or if there was an emergency, um, those things are all outside of the policy. It basically would be if you, if council had something they wanted to send to a member of senior staff on a Saturday afternoon, if they wanted it to be addressed because it was an emergency, they would need to highlight that in their email. Um, but I think respectively, I think senior staff would reply to council pretty much all hours if they could. So um, again, this is basically just following the provincial policy statement that's been passed. I, th I think, Michelle, when we send emails, like, you know, on a Sunday morning or something, it's just that we're catching up with ours. I don't think anybody expects an answer right back. It's just to get it off our cases. I, I don't know how anybody else feels, but like you said, if it's an emergency, we mark it that way and move forward. Okay, Member Taylor. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like if, if you are doing something and say I'm taking off uh, Monday, but I've got time on Saturday or Sunday, I don't expect an answer till you get back into the office and do stuff. Uh, so I agree. Yep. Anybody else have a comment? Okay. Um, Allison? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh, 
member or um, CAO, Lori Kennard, she'd like to speak. Thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble putting my camera on. Um, I, I don't want to derail this conversation because it's just an exercise, but just a thought for council when you're sending those, um, getting them off your desk. I try to use for a staff delay receipt. There's a, a function just so because we we have we all have an unfortunate habit of reading the things and responding, even though we know you don't expect it till Monday. We we are all very dedicated and read our emails. So if staff are away or if it's vacation and I have something that's on my mind that I want to get it, I just email it on delayed receipt so then they get it when when they should get it. It's just a, a nicety if you if you think about it. Thank you for those comments. Allison, you got a motion for us. Sure. Motion reads that administration report number A22-016 dated May 25th, 2022 regarding Bill 27, employee disconnecting from work policy be received and that human resources policy number XX employee disconnecting from work be adopted as outlined in appendix one of this report. We were in a seconder, please. Moved by member Stevens, seconded by member Cox. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, Michelle, I think you're up probably for if, if I can request a quick five minute bio break, that would be very I'll my hand with that too. <laughs> okay, five minutes. We'll be back at 10.30.
drawn at F32. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The next report is deals with a proposed group benefit plan design. Uh, we spoke about this um, in the 2022 budget process. So we did set some money aside at that point to uh, address our current benefit plan. It also was on the goals list for the CAO this year as well. So basically this report, um, we use a study that was done by Mosey and Mosey, our current brokers for Tay Township in the fall of 2021. We felt that that was still pretty accurate. It used a lot of our comparators that you had approved for the wage study back in 2020. Um, we also did a quick survey with staff and members of council if they wish to participate in that. And we got some really good feedback from that internal survey, I would say the most. The study from Mosey and Mosey showed that Severn Township's benefits by far were very, very low. Um, this group change really is long overdue. They, our benefits have not changed in 25 years. Um, we changed them a little bit in 2020 with the addition of the out of province travel, but that was at no cost. It was more of a planned design change that we kind of got as a bonus. So um, if you flip to the second part of the report, uh, you'll see the little charts there. Um, basically we asked staff if there was two things that we would, they could like to have increased on the uh, paramedicals. It was definitely eyeglasses. Our current uh, limit is $200. If you wear glasses at all, you know that that certainly does not go very far these days. Um, the other thing that they asked for was a little bit more for a massage therapist. Um, we asked them if there was any other benefits they'd like to see included. And you can see in that list, there was things like gym memberships, eye surgeries, more mental health coverage, um, benefits for retirees, et cetera. So in the final chart, you'll see our current and then our proposed. Um, wishes that we're asking for. So for vision, we're asking to go from $200 uh, to $400 every 24 months. However, we are also going to include in that description that it could be used for your eye exam, uh, eye surgery. So basically you could use that $400 towards any eye or vision care that was required. Michelle, can I ask you a question here? Uh, of course. When you're saying you can use that for your eye exam, has the Ontario government not opened that back up now to seniors that we can have the eye exams free of charge? Not not free of charge, through OHIP? Um, I believe for uh, seniors, yes, that is true. If you're under the age of 65, that's still not uh, a benefit that's covered and children are still covered as well. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the other change would be for chiropractic. Right now, our coverage is $200, but we make our employees pay the first 150. So really it's not a benefit much at all. That's an old carryover from the OHIP days when OHIP would pay the $150 deductible. So we're just asking that to be increased to $300 a person. Same for massage therapy from 200 to 300. Um, there's one change under drugs. Um, it was recommended by our brokers that we are one of the very few municipalities left that don't ask for generic drug, drugs. Um, so what that means is automatically generic drugs would be, if you needed Advil, you would get ibuprofen. Um, but if your doctor said that you needed to have Advil, they would just have to fill out a prescription stating that you needed the name brand for that. So um, Mosey and Mosey have been very clear about that. They said that is a large cost savings for us in our plan um, and that there is very little complaints about that across the board. So we felt that that was probably a good move for our plan. Um, on to psychologists and so social workers, etc. We are asking that to be uh, moved up to $500 per person. We've also expanded the terminology in there. It used to be just psychologists, but through our surveys, we found people are needing more mental health support, um, whether that's you know through family crisis or personal crisis. Um, so we felt that five hundred dollars was a good change there and a good start to providing mental a better mental health package for our employees. The other thing is a another large change is the dental major services. Currently, we have no coverage for that whatsoever. 
Um, so we're adding, we're asking to add 50% reimbursement to an annual maximum of $1,500 per person. So that would cover any, it would be money towards a bridge or a cap or a crown, et cetera, in that package. Um, we do know over the last few years that in order to attract and retain employees, um, benefits are now something that is very much asked during recruitment process. Recruiting is very difficult right now to attract people. So um, the part of the reason for this report is, is, is that as well. Thank you. Any further questions to anyone? <clears throat> Any comments? Okay, seeing none. Allison, would you like to read a motion, please? Certainly. Uh, the motion reads that administration report number 822-018 regard dated May 25th, 2022 with respect to benefit plan design be received and further that the recommended changes as noted in this report be implemented effective July 1st, 2022. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Member Taylor, second by Member McIntyre. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, Michelle, moving right along, F33. I believe that's over to Allison. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Allison? Uh, certainly. So following discussions that have been had over the last couple months about moving, um, coming back into chambers, going to hybrid, testing of our new system that we have in place, um, staff are bringing forward the following report. So staff are recommending option four, and I'll explain what that is. So Option one is that we just flat out for everything remain status quo all the way to the end of the council term. Status or option two is to commence hybrid meetings. So we are set up for this at this point. If we wanted to start with it, we could. Option three would be to commence hybrid meetings purely for council and what I'm calling standing committee. So that would be <coughs> services and planning and development. All of our other committees would remain on Zoom. Option four, is a combination of option one and three. So option one being, so this option would have council standing committees, quasi judicial, so that's your committee of adjustment, property standards committee uh, remain virtual. Advisory committees would permanently remain virtual. So culture and rec, um, villages and hamlets, accessibility advisory committee, things like that. So. Part of this has come out of discussions um, that have happened across many municipalities coming out of COVID is, is that, is there a balance to be struck between in-person and hybrid? Is there a balance to be struck between in-person and virtual? Um, and whether or not do all committees need to come back? Do they function just as effectively or better virtually? So um, having had the discussion from our side, um, at this point in time, we're recommending that our advisory committees permanently remain virtual and that the other committees, so Corporate Services Council, Planning and Development, Committee of Adjustment, Property Standards would remain virtual to the end of the term and then that would be subject to review at the start of the next term when we review meeting schedule, everything. Um, so, and I don't know that we had a couple of council members that turned up for our council test if they want to speak to um, how that hybrid environment functioned. So, yeah, that that staff's recommendation, um, but I hope it reflects where council was leaning. So, at least on the stay virtual to the end of the term for most of it. So, okay, Member Cox. Yeah, through the chair. Um, I was at the virtual and I was on a virtual end and then I was there and it doesn't really work. It's very hard if you're the chair because you're looking after microphones and you're making sure somebody else is off and if they're not off, the other person's on. The person who speaks, um, their face comes up, but the other person, if they're virtual, their faces are big and the rest of the council is small. It, it just was very confusing and it just didn't work right. And there were times when you could hear people and not hear people. So I am fine with option four. Thank you. Four or three? Oh, four. Okay. That is quo, no hybrid meetings. And then after the election, see what happens. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I would like to stay virtual. I mean, we're, we're here now. It's working out. It, it was hard at first. Nobody likes change. But now that we're here, I think it's working fairly well. And to start off to a new council, maybe the COVID will have 
gone by the wayside a little bit and we can see what at that time what needs to be changed remember okay. Matt? oh sorry Alice, sorry. You i just wanted to follow up on councillor cox's comments um with respect to the hybrid environment so and maybe Councillor Cox or, Mem or Member Cat could um, speak to it as well. I think for stuff like delegations, and if someone's speaking at a public meeting, having them appear on the screen will be fine. Um, it's when council itself is split between the dais and the screen that it's very awkward. Um, the microphone thing we've fixed, Councillor Cox, so that is no push to talk piece anymore. Um, but with respect to whether council has to be in person and the awkwardness of that for the chair, um, I think the this, this setup will work fine for stuff like delegations in the future and for those that want to chime in to participate at a public meeting or such as Inspector Yateman to do like his quarterly update, completely appropriate because council would have all their attention on who's, who's speaking, um, but the setup is awkward for um, regular committee business when you're trying to have a discussion. Yeah. Okay, member of cat. You're, you're, you're muted, Member Burkett. There you go. Sorry, right through you, Madam Chair. It was uh, very awkward to uh, to run a meeting. And as you know, we've, we've never had so many people attend our meetings through Zoom. And we wouldn't have uh, Member Taylor here today if, if he was in, in, and it's like he's right here with us. Right. And he is, like, I think this is, uh, this is great. As much as I'd like to be in the council chambers and, and have you all together, this does work really well. So we'll let the new council decide uh, in the fall which way they'd like to go. Member McIntyre. Uh, through the chair, I don't know any other way. I've been here three years-ish and this has worked for me and uh, this is the way it is for me. So I'll, I'll agree with the group if uh, and the consensus is that we're going to do uh, something different after the election, then we that we can look at that then. But for now, it's it worked out very nicely for me. Okay. okay, and then just for point of clarification, then between option one and option four, the only real difference is whether or not our advisory committees remain permanently hybrid or not, or sorry, permanently virtual or not. Um, staff are recommending that those committees remain virtual permanently. Um, so if council is okay with that, then that would be option four. And it will require a minor amendment to the procedural bylaw, but that's fairly easily done. Okay, any comments? So if you'd like to read that motion, Allison? Certainly. So the motion reads that administration report number A22-19 dated May 25th, 2022 regarding council and committee meetings be received and that option four be approved mm -hmm. and further that any re further review of council and committee meetings be postponed until the new council term and further that the council procedure bylaw be amended as required to facilitate option four. Okay, move our seconder, please. Moved by member Cox, second by member Burkett. All in favor? And that's uh, one no and five yeses. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move right past property standards <laughs> and go down to F35 social media strategy. Allison? I believe this is Tracy. Tracy? Morning, Tracy. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. and see. Perfect. Um, so Allison, I guess I can probably just share my screen. Is that how? Yep, correct. Okay. Yep. Well, almost. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> yeah, we're here. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, good morning again, um, Chair and members of the committee. So this is, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Of course, this is my first time kind of seeing you all in this um, in this uh, situation. So bear with me if I make a few um mistakes but this uh so this presentation is is in support of the report you received a 22021 um regarding the social media strategy as attached and also the um uh update on the asset creation 
So for the presentation, I'm just gonna uh, provide a little bit of background, a summary of the project as well, highlights of the strategy that has been created, and just give you a quick preview of some of the creative assets that were developed as part of this project. So over the past years, uh, past few years, sorry, with the direction and support of council, we've put more focus into our communication efforts. Um, so as I just identified there, it was a key priority in council's 2020 to 2022 strategic plan, um, specifically being item uh, 3.1a, being improved use of social media and, and general communications. And then in 2020, you hired your first communications officer. You then developed your new award-winning brand identity in 2020. And so to continue to deliver further on council's strategic plan, as I noted, uh, staff did secure external funding um, from the County of Simcoe to help fund the development of a social media strategy to help deliver on that strategic action. So overall, the goals of the, uh, of the project uh, were to identify our goals, um, our audiences, um, and which platforms we'd be using, to develop a calendar as a tool um, to allow us to pre-schedule and um, pre-schedule and organize our content, as well overall improve communications, engagement, and customer service, and as well, not noted there, but to create a visual asset library that meets uh, the guidelines and the quality that is required to use those photos and on social media and on our website. So as part of the process, you may recall, um, you and I, each of you did meet um, in the spring. So thank you very much uh, for meeting with me. So your input was very important to this process as you yourselves are asked these questions every day that we want to kind of um, to share that information on social media as another way to get that information to our stakeholders. Um, so some of what I heard from council was, you know, continue to highlight our warmth and rural charm um, continue to work to simplify the building and planning process by doing small campaigns that uh, are designed to educate and inform the community, as well as share information on our assets, such as our infrastructure assets to drive civic pride, understanding and stewardship of these resources, and also to increase use of the community calendar and to highlight cultural events, um, happenings in Severin and encourage people to, to come out and enjoy what we have to offer. So the results also as part of that, I did meet with um, the senior management team as well as their respective uh, uh, teams um, to identify the priorities for each of those departments so that we could start to build that schedule of content, which will then be shared um, via these different platforms. So kind of the, the high level overview of the strategy itself. So it does include four strategic goals, um, five objectives, six strategic actions and 25 actions um, underneath that. So I will give you kind of a, um, a quick overview of some of that as well. As well, the pardon me, um, <laughs> the strategy itself also does include a review of where we are right now. Of course, it's important to establish that baseline. Um, examples of social media best practices from other municipalities. So, you know, we've taken the time to learn and see what is working well in other areas. Um, also about how we're going to evaluate and measure the success of this strategy, uh, how often we're going to report back to council to ensure that we're, we're meeting the objectives that we've set out and also some future recommendations just for communications in general. So I, I spoke to about the four strategic goals. So, um, those are, uh, you know, through this strategy, we have, it, it develops a clear focus for us to 2025. Hmm. So how we're actually going to improve our use of social media and enhance our communications using those platforms with our residents and our stakeholders. So um, really what we want to do is we want to create a more informed and engaged community. We want to share trustworthy and consistent content that people continually come to us to look to us as, you know, what is going on with this issue? Um, Severn should have the answer, that type of thing. Also a stronger brand identity and online presence for the township. So that of course is part of a conversation that's already happening through the, um, the implementation of your brand identity with your new logo, your new colors, all of that that was approved. Um, also through this, we really want to increase the sense of community pride and quality of life in Severn, um, along with increasing the confidence of the community in local government and our municipality as a whole. And then as well, strengthen our partnerships in the community. So community groups, businesses, or not-for-profit organizations, all of those organizations that make Severn a great place to be, we want to uh, continue to build those relationships with them. 
So uh, just a few examples of the, the objectives. So as I said, we have five objectives and these were all um, selected to be SMART. So just a, a review of what that means. So specific, we wanted them to be measurable, of course, because we want to report back to you on how we're progressing in terms of the strategy. Uh, measurable, um, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So when are we going to achieve this specific, mm -hmm. specific objective by and how are we going to do that? Um, so really, you know, for example, the first one improved processes to reduce reactive and increase proactive content creation. So that really is about um, being able to identify events or occurrences or projects in advance that allow us to pre-schedule and plan um, those communications and social media posts. So I think a lot of people would understand what reactive content is. So you're constantly responding, like you're not, you're not, um, it's not that you're actually planning to do that content, but you're either addressing an issue or commenting on something that is already occurring when really, if you're pre-planning that, it re really does allow you to be more successful. Um, another um, objective, um, such as um, creating a stronger human face to township staff. So that is going to be connected to us trying to highlight, you know, who is caring for our assets? How many of these assets do we have, both gray and green? So for example, our 413 kilometers of roads and you know, featuring information about how we're caring for these assets and the types of projects that we are implementing in order to maintain and improve everything that the township has. And then for objectives, objectives four and five, um, I have started developing a dashboard. So a dashboard is a tool that mm -hmm. allows us to pre-schedule content. So I've actually started to schedule content for up to a year now. So I know that seems really in advance. And of course, sometimes we have to, we have to re-look re at it and, and edit it. But there's some things that happen every year. For example, last week was Public Works Week. We know that's going to happen again the same time next year. So we can use some of the information that we shared with our community this year regarding um, you know, the great work that our Public Works team does do. But we can recycle that content and update it next year so that we have some somewhere to start. We're not creating everything from zero. So it's really going to improve our, efficient, our efficiency. Um, and as well, we have, um, of course, you may know uh, when we launched our new website um, in 2020, uh, we did as part of that create a, a community calendar. So that's actually a tool for the community to use to um, submit their events, which I then review. And then if I need more details, I reach out to them. If not, then then that um, event is posted to that calendar. But of course, with the challenges we've had over the past couple of years, there wasn't very many community events going on. So now is the time to really start promoting that as a tool within the community and encouraging residents and stakeholders to use it and kind of a, use it as a what's happening in Severn, right? And the great thing about that is that subscribers to that calendar are then sent a weekly kind of email blast that says this is what this is what's happening in Severn this week so we think it's a really great tool and we know that a few um, uh, of yourselves have really wanted mm. us to increase the use of that so we've identified that as an objective as well so I'm not going to go through all of these of course you've probably seen um, you know the strategy was attached to the agenda package um, but I just want to kind of give a quick overview of kind of what these these titles mean. So working from the inside out. So we know that there's some work to do internally about uh, creating, implementing and evaluating new processes that can help us to improve our communications and social media efforts, such as staff and council training, uh, myself meeting regularly uh, with departments that have high content needs. Um, and continuing to enhance our photo assets and our video assets, right? We continually need new fresh content that really is helping to promote and share um, information about Severn. And then as well, um, so this one is really about uh, measurement, evaluation and reporting. Um, so, it, you know, how are we, oh, sorry, wrong page, pardon me. Um, so this one is actually about um, increasing our engagement, pardon me. So uh, this has to do with the annual video strategy that we'd like to develop. So identifying two to three topics per year that we can, you know, where we can feature staff and the services that they provide to our community. Um, so, you know, that our stakeholders do understand the services that the municipality provides to them. Just another avenue um, for this. 
Um, so, sorry, mm -hmm. then this is the one that is mostly about measurement and evaluation and reporting. So increasing our understanding of the audience or increasing our audience insights. So um, up until now, we've just been kind of looking at, you know, how many people are following us on each platform. Um, but there's some really kind of more meaningful measurements that I think we need to start uh, tracking to really understand how we can improve our efforts over time. Um, so we are going to be using a tool um, um, that will help us do that. So that's in the process of being set up. And again, I, I've noticed I've noted video a few times, but uh, there is an expectation generally that um, there's different kinds of content on different platforms. And video is one of the ones we haven't really begun to use besides our, our YouTube channel, of course, where we're streaming um, meetings and such like that. But this is different. This is more kind of, um, you know, purpose of engagement, not necessarily just information, but kind of both combined. And then also we want to improve our readiness for issues management. So one of the things that um, we've identified is that we need to create, um, you know, kind of uh, templates for to address key or common issues such as uh, pre-approved social content by the CIO, CAO for things such as an officer facility closure, a water main break, things like that. That could potentially happen. Of course, we want to be prepared and not reacting in the moment. Um, and also just continuing to improve um, staff competency um, in issues management and the use of so and in the use of so social media because it is constantly training so changing, um, so training is required moving forward. And then for the last one, um, this does kind of connect to a few of our other. Um, items, but we really, it's about improving our content. So I think I did mention earlier in the presentation, just about we have how we have already reached out to other municipalities about their social media and communication efforts to see what's been working well and what hasn't. Um, so, so that's part of our process as well as ensuring that we're doing things that have a proven track work record and we know that can be successful. Um, and again, that, um, that note about just making the community more aware of the services we provide and providing that human face to municipal services. So that's something we're going to be, we're currently working on and we'll be continuing to work on as part of this strategy. So in terms of how often I'll be reporting on the actual strategy itself. So, um, you know, I've proposed one annual progress report per year based on capacity, but we also do our annual, so not our annual, part of me, um, our monthly council <laughs> updates, which will include some information about the progress that we are making. Um, and it will also allow us, um, as we're moving forward, to adjust our efforts as needed um, to enhance our results. So in terms of, uh, that was kind of the high points of the strategy itself, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the um, creative assets. So. Um, oh, for both of these, the development of the social media strategy and the um, development of the creative, asset, creative assets, um, I did mention earlier, but the funding was provided by Tourism Simcoe County. And the development of the creative assets being a 500 plus high quality web um, and print uh, collection of photographs showcasing Severn in summer, fall and winter was also supported through um, a financial contribution from Aurelian Lake Country Tourism. Um, so that was that's uh, provided us with a um, with assets that can be used in videos. They can be used on our website as well. You know, really high quality images for social media and for print ads, magazines, anything that we need to use them for. They they now meet those those standards. So not only do they provide an image bank for us, but they also provide um, an image bank for all staff. So all of these photos are available to staff to use in presentations, reports, general media, plans, for example, now that we're, we're undertaking some, um, some municipal plans such as our recreation master plan, um, the, all of these photos could be used in, in those types of publications as well as they are print ready. Um, for example, the one on the screen there, that's an aerial drone photo that was taken of the Wishago outdoor rink in the winter. So we have a couple of those. We also have some, some ice level shots that were taken. So great selection. And of course, everyone will remember uh, the barn quilts. So we have also a selection of those that are in Severn. We've, we've taken, got some great photos of that. Some are now being used on the website and also uh, we use them in social media. 
Um, and a great thing about this project as well is that these assets were also provided back to Tourism Simcoe County and Aurelia and Lake Country Tourism for use on their own platforms and within their media products. So that means <laughs> Every time that they that they use a Severn photo, they'll be tagging it or identifying it as a Severn photo that, of course, promotes us and encourages people, encourages awareness of what Severn has to offer. So just a few examples of the of the assets that were developed. Um, as I said, there's 500 plus different photos, which I, you know, I'm working right now with uh, one of our summer students who has graciously accepted to start uh, tagging and locating all these photos for me so that they're easier for staff to to access. Um, but for example, the Coldwater Mill, um, we have a lot that include tourism locations such as the Coldwater Canadiana Museum, um, images of our natural trails, and also we were able to get some really high quality shots of our municipal facilities and buildings. And I did mention uh, previously the one that was ice level at the Washego um, uh, Community Center. So that's uh, an action shot there of some residents using our, our outdoor rink in the winter. Um, another picture of the mill in the winter and then as well a uh, picture of the Utah Trail uh, being used by snowmobilers. So lots of great images that can be used um, across the seasons to share, um, you know, the beauty of Severn. So that is uh, kind of an overview there, lots of information, but um, if, I, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Thank you. Tracy, if you could unshare, then I'd be able to see everybody. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, Member Burkett has his. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. So Tracy, I don't know how to thank you. Last night when I started to read this at uh, 9.30, I usually fall asleep. <laughs> but the information that was in this kept me awake. I, I'm so excited about what you brought back to council. I know that some of us struggle with change, but I, I am welcoming this with open arms. And I know, Lynn, before you, I know that some of us struggled, me included, with some of the changes that she tried to bring forward, but it, it all works out because this is the thing of the future. And if we can't embrace it, but very, very well done, I'm going to read it again and again. There's a lot of information in there. And I just wanted to thank you very much for all your hard work. Well done. Member Fox. Uh, I echo what uh, Member Bouquet said, but I'm also so happy to see that we are getting our communications out there and that we're partnering with Lake Country and probably the Chamber and the County. And I, I love the whole fact of the partnering with Community Pride and the different days you had done. You, you've done a wonderful job here and, and I like the fact that it's all um, measurable and achievable and and you've you've really worked hard on this and, I, and i'm very happy to say that i think that we've come a long way and and you're taking us right up there with everyone else on our social media campaign hey, any other comment hey thank you tracy for your all your work and this is great allison gray oh i believe member stevens wanted to make a comment member stevens Hold down your space bar. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that I have worked with Tracy for a number of years prior to here in, in another area to another committee and uh, uh, her uh, effectiveness in putting things together in a, in a strong way is, is, is excellent. And I think we, we will enjoy what the benefits we get from having Tracy with this group. Thank you for your comments, Tracy. Uh, okay. Is there anyone else that would like to say anything? Okay, Allison, motion please. Certainly, so the motion reads that report number A22-021 dated May 25th, 2022 with respect to the social media strategy and asset creation update be received, that the social media strategy be approved and that staff be directed to move forward with the implementation of the social media strategy. Move and a seconder please. Moved by Member Cox, seconded by Member Stevens. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you again, Tracy. Have a good day. Okay. I believe, Madam Chair, we're at the two items that were pulled, which is, I think the first one was the advance list. Okay. So I pulled that. I'm going to speak to it. When I go off to that advance list, I had asked several months ago for an update on that portable in Coldwater, and I see it's disappeared right off the advance list. 
unless I'm not seeing it. No, it's it's on the third page. Um, so each page is broken apart by department. I did miss that. I missed that in there. Okay, thanks. Nope, I just uh, wondered where it had gone to. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Member Cox. You're muted, Member Cox. Okay, um, I wanna to speak to this John, 12 John Street water bill. Um, oh, we're not there yet, Member Cox, unless Deputy Oh, Mayor. I thought, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm done. done. Sorry, I'm done. I went down. Sorry, I, I thought, thought you were done. Big vacant spot, and I thought, I'm missing other things, and I stopped. Sorry, so, sorry. Member Cox, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, if it's okay, I, uh, I, I would like to speak to this, because I think that the homeowner made many valid comments and had backup for her comments. And she has, uh, she has written me some things and I would ask if the committee minds if I read some of her comments in reply to Derek's report. Would that be okay? Okay. I'm not sure, is that okay, Allison? Um, it, normally, I, it's entirely up to council. It's well, it, in other words, there are concerns that have been raised and, and if she's told me, can I raise them or do I ask that maybe Derek meets with her so she has a chance to reply to some of these things that she feels haven't been stated clearly of what she has done. So I just want to know when she gets a chance to say maybe that there are some of the things that have been done in this report that really didn't work what she said in her report. I'm not sure how we go with this. Perhaps as a suggestion then perhaps Member Cox could read the comments out and Member Burkett, I'm sure probably, um, or sorry, Director Burkett, not Member Burkett, Director Burkett um, uh, Burke. Burke Burke. could respond um, because I'm sure he has the answers. I'm sure. Okay. Go ahead, Member Cox. Um, the report said that WAMCO tested it when it was actually Atlantic liquid meter testing. And it says that Christy accepted the WAMCO, I accused WAMCO of falsifying results to avoid the lawsuit. And that was completely false and never said. This is where I'm going with this. Do we not just be able to let this person sit with Derek and go through this? Can I ask it to be deferred for that? Derek? So through or how the, do we do this? Yeah, through and, the and chair. Laurie? What, what I'd recommend is uh, certainly we will meet with the customer. Um, we have, and uh, we can go again, um, kind of discuss the items. But I think there's still, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, there's a request for relief from these, from these uh, fees and staff have no reason to believe that these fees are inaccurate. Um, CAO. Thank you. I was just going to follow that up that I know um, staff, particularly Julie, as the revenue clerk and Derek have spent an inordinate amount of time working with this res resident. And at the end of the day, we've agreed to disagree. So I think council has to decide, do you want to test more? Do you want to offer relief? Um, we, we're, of course, always concerned about setting precedents with relief um, when uh, nothing has been proven that, that it requires it, but totally up to council. I, I'm not sure us talking to the residents more would assist in that. Um, the, the lawsuit, she did actually speak quite at length about a class action suit in the US. So I think that's where Derek got that point. Um, and obviously we're not seeing any class action lawsuits here uh, in cold water for defective meters. So I think that's what drove that particular point. Okay, member Taylor had his card up and then- I have supplemental, please. Go ahead with your supplemental. Um, so the other one was that th those toilets and things were tested by plumbers and they were also, um, our staff went in, um, oh, um, Ivan, and he saw it. So my concern here is, is that there was an issue with this meter and that we, the homeowner paid for it. And I think that it should be tested again. And I think we should pay for it to be tested because I can't figure out any other reason. I mean, all the other ones I've ever seen and had in front of me, we have discovered that someone's left the toilet run, something has been left on, somebody wasn't home and somebody checked it, something was broken. This is the only one in all the years I've ever been on council that I actually am going, hmm, this just doesn't seem right because people have been in to test it, everything's been done, it was newly renovated and it just isn't making sense to me. Thank you. 
Okay, Member Taylor and then Member Briquette. Yeah, through the chair to Derek, how many water meters do we have in the system? Uh, this particular area, I think there's 588. No, I'm saying uh, township wide. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I'd have to get that number for you. Sorry, it's not at the top of my head. So these, all I'm saying, uh, as the CAO said, this is a slippery slope here. We've got to make sure we're consistent. If, and Derek does his due diligence, and that's what we rely on, due diligence. And if you open the box here, there's a thousand water meters out there and uh, we have to make sure we do everything we, we have at our end and that's what Derek's proposing in, in his uh, report. Okay, Member Burkett. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. So I'm sorry, what would it cost to have this, this tested again? What would it cost? I, I can't oh, remember. 160. 160 is what it cost the first time. So if we test it and find that it's not deficient, we have already tested it, have we not? Did we test it one time before or no? Through the mayor, yes, or through the chair, yes, we have tested it. So if we test it one more time and, and it comes back that it's fine, um, like is council okay with that? And, and that would put it to an end. Obviously it's not the meter. Obviously something has been left running in the house and we would absorb the $160. I, I don't know, I just think this, this cannot be true. Like when she told us how much water it was using, like there would have been something somewhere to tick this off, <clears throat> That's an astronomical bill. And we don't even know, I, I don't know. Sorry, I, I like, like other times we've known they've they've seen it running out of basements they somebody said yes i've left the tap running so my water wouldn't freeze there's always been a reason but there's no reason here that we can find member cox yeah through the chair if we've already tested it and everybody thinks that, that testing is just going to say it i would prefer to give this person relief due to the fact of what i've spoken to and then Deputy Mayor just said what I, I mean, the chair just said what I had said. We both agree that there's, we can't find where this water went. There's so much water and the bill's so high. I just don't know where it is. And the meter and the wall mount, the meter reader and the wall mount were tested. So member McIntyre and then member Burkett. Uh, through the chair, I have a big problem trying to figure out how much of this water was actually, you'd have to run a fire hose 24 hours a day. Something is wrong with the equipment in my opinion. There's no way this family used that much water in that short period of time. Whether we have it retested again at our expense, $160 doesn't have a lot. I mean, that's $160 is not a lot of money. However, if it comes back the same and they say the equipment's good, I'm having a big problem where in the heck that water all went and how it happened and such such volumes in such a short period of time. So I really prefer to look at the and have some sense of belief in the family that says that they didn't use all that water. So then it's up to this council, I think, to consider whether we should relief, uh, it's to some degree, the, the amount of the water bill. I mean. Okay, uh, so I've got, I've got. I've got. I've got uh, Derek Burke, then I've got Member Burkett, then I've got Member Stevens, and then back to Member Cox. Thank Derek. you, through the, through the chair. I just wanted to, um, in, on the impossible scenario, the idea that this quantity of water over 91 days is impossible to consume, um, it's entirely possible. It's actually even possible to maybe not even notice. Um, th those running quantities would go directly into the drain, into the sanitary sewer system, and neither our operators or the homeowner would become aware of it uh, in those kinds of quantities. Okay, so I, Andrew Plunkett has his card up, or he's waving, so I'll get Andrew in here before we continue. Uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Chair. The, my only comment is I actually received a bill in the city of Aurelia. Uh, because my hose ran for about two and a half days when we were away. And that bill was $2,200. So it doesn't take very long to generate um, a fairly substantial amount of water use. 
Okay, thanks for those comments, Andrew. It was Member Burkett, Member Stevens, and then back to Member Cox. Hear you, Madam Chair. So I'm struggling with this as well. Like the, the young lady gave a great presentation. Even if the toilet was running and it was running for that length of time, we all go to the toilet two or three times a day. They would have caught it. So again, we didn't, they didn't see anything outside that was leaking. And I assume, and maybe Mr. Burke could answer this, did they have a sub pump that runs off of water? That's water driven. Because I remember years ago, we did have a case where, where the problem was the sub pump that uh, ran off of water. So through, through the chair, not that we have found, um, and we did not assess. So it's, uh, I could not say one way or the other if they have a water-driven sump pump. Um, once again, uh, just to reiterate, a single toilet with a flapper valve stuck open would consume in the order of this kind of water over 91 days, um, just to be clear, right? Like, so that's, it is possible to consume this type of water. Okay, are you okay with that, Member Briquette? Well, supplementary to you, Madam Chair, I understand what, what's being said. And the last thing I want to do is set something that's, that's precedent setting. And we've had many of these before us over the course of the last 12 years we've been here. But this one, again, doesn't, is there something wrong with this scenario? As I said, like you would notice if your toilet was running, you go to the washroom two or three times a day, four times a day. And I think she, I'm struggling with this one. Yeah, because they even had a plumber check the toilets. But anyway, yes. Member Stevens, you're up next, and then Member Cox. Uh, Ron, just hold down your space bar. Okay. I, I would like to see us do another test on this, just for the sheer amount of water that has uh, we're talking about now. It's, it's, it's a greater number. And for the sake of $160, let's get it done to our satisfaction and the ladies as well. Okay, thanks for those comments, Member Cox. But according to the Public Works Director, it's already been assessed and her water, she has not had her hose on, It's the valve will shut off, they just opened it a week ago. And the one thing that bothers me the most is once that new meter went on, their consumption was lower than it ever had been. So that's where I get the fact that I don't know what we're supposed, how many times we test, it's just, it's not making sense. And I believe that we should give her relief from this bill. Okay, Member Taylor. Yeah, just to the chair, just to wrap up, Derek did say it is possible that it could it could have happened. There's a reason there it could happen. Okay, what are we gonna do here? Allison, do you have a Oh, Member Bettsworth, and then back to Member Cox. Uh, thank you, through the chair. What, let's review the figures. What's the outstanding bill? 5,000, what is it there now? 400 something. 5,186. Hmm, unbelievable. Um, we, we've talked about the toilets. Uh, running and I, I agree with the comments that have been made I don't think that could go unobserved to that volume of water because of a toilet uh, how convinced or sure are we that the meter has functioned properly to me that is very suspicious as the source of this problem Derek could you answer that or through the chair, I think the best uh, way to answer that is we have no reason to believe that it wasn't functioning properly, right? So we had a series of readings that, that were sequential um, and showed a, a significant increase over a short period of time of water use. And, you know, given that that's abnormal, you know, we promptly took the machine out and had a third party bench tested uh, by Atlantic Industries, who is a laboratory grade testing service. So with those facts in hand, I would say that staff have no reason to believe this was not reporting accurate figures. Okay, so does anybody want to speak or we just yeah, one more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you do a test, do you just do the meter or do you do the reader and the wall mount? So through the chair, the test was performed on the meter. The, the reader has not shown any, you know, 
uh, indications of failure at the system at large. As Councillor Taylor noted, we have 1,800 um, meters throughout the township. And so we have been reporting accurate figures on all, all of those. Um, and the wall mount itself is just a relay. So no, we tested the meter. Okay. Well, I'd like to put forth a motion that we relieve, that this is be relieved. Thank you, please. Andrew, you have a comment? If I uh, can, Madam Chair, we, we've had a couple of other uh, very high water bills come to council and, and both of those were actually in excess of $25,000. Yeah. One of those properties, the woman didn't even realize she had a leak, even though she'd received a water bill for $25,000. So it, it certainly is, is possible for, you know, that much water to run without somebody noticing it. Now, where it goes, I guess that's a different question, but I would argue that we're on fairly uh, dangerous ground by granting relief when we don't have any proof that the meter was malfunctioning. Like I would certainly support sending the meter uh, to another company to analyze it, that which would make, uh, and if they come back and say that the meter is not faulty, then it's it's hard for us to dispute the water uh, amount going through the meter. And I know in the past one, I remember those two extremely high bills. And what we did was um, they came in and talked to you and arranged how to pay it over a long term. So there is there is those options. But uh, I know the one ladies was leaking into a crawl space. But anyway, um, Member Burkett had his um, card up. Would you like to speak again? Go ahead. You, Madam Chair. So to Andrew's point, why don't we send the meter back and see if there's something wrong with it? Okay, that's fine. So I think that's where we are all safe with going, Allison. Is that where, just put your hand up if you think that that's where we should go and Allison can get a. Okay. Uh, Member Cox, you don't want it sent back? No, that's, that's fine, but will it come back to us this report on the testing? Well, I expect so, Derek, is that right? Uh, through the chair, if I may, uh, we had crafted the report to end it here, uh, but we certainly can report back. If we find that the, the meter does have a, a discrepancy based on percent, I think staff would be happy to apply the percent reduction. Um, you know, if the meter came back accurate again, uh, you know, we would ex expect that those utility charges are accurate and the charges are due. Um, but if, you know, committee was to direct us to report further findings, then we certainly will. Okay. I think we would, uh, Allison, I think it's that, that the committee wants it tested again and the reports come back to us. Is that how everybody feels? Member Taylor? And, and uh, just that we would pay for it. Yeah, I think we should pay for it this time. They've already paid for it once. We can't ask them to do it again. Allison, could you read something and we could see or change or? Just, can I just ask, may I please just ask, yeah. sorry, yeah. may I please just ask Mr. Burke a question? Yeah. What is what is a reader? What is what is a reader? It, does it need to be tested? Uh, through the chair. So the, the reader itself is um, a small device. It looks like a tablet. And uh, it is the machine that goes and, and will grab the information from the relay. And uh, it'll know the address, the meter number, um, the previous utilities billing history. It will record the current one. And that gets uploaded into the system that produces the invoice. So can it be tested? So it, it does not fail. It's, it's, a, it's a computer. And so the only time that uh, it is performed maintenance <laughs> is <laughs> No, it, 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 firmware, firmware updates are something that we do on a regular basis, but um, there's not really a test you could do on the on the reader itself. Okay, um, CEO, let's start. I did, I did see people laugh when the Derek said computers don't fail. It's maybe not that computers don't story. fail, but <laughs> <laughs> the reader's going up and down the street, so it wouldn't be limited to one household. If there was an error, we would know in the in all of the buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like that better than computers. Yeah. Mode. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Allison, you go ahead. 
Just for point of clarification, so the new testing, is it to be done at the homeowner selection or at our selection? Is the drafted report for the, the crafted motion that was the alternate motion from the director um, proposed that it be a third party testing agent of the homeowner selection. Now that means that we're going to send it. It's not going to the homeowner to provide it directly to them. We will send it ourselves, but. Yeah, I would like it to go to a different one than we had test this time. Is that possible, Derek? Yeah, through the chair. I mean, we only really know of the one testing agent uh, readily available, but we'll search for, uh, you know, an equivalent testing agent, that's fine. Well, I think it should be somebody different. Yeah. What's the committee feel? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Allison. Okay. I still think that reader needs to be looked at. Allison, do you want to read what you have there? And we'll see what, how it goes. Give me one moment here. Certainly. <laughs> Okay, so the motion will read then. That public works report number W22-018 dated May 25th, 2022 with respect to 12 John Street water bill be received and further that staff be directed to send the water meter for another third party testing agent manufacturer approved different than the company who conducted the first test and further that staff report back with the testing results. Is, put is, the one, is the one that we're going to do, will they test the gears? Okay. Through the chair. So the tests are, are based on float. Uh, so they run water through it and they measure that kind of water that came out. And uh, so that does test the gears, if you will, or the mechanism that records and measures water. Um, okay. Certainly, I, I mean, if council wants to add um, that we send all equipment related to uh, to testing, including our meter reading uh, device, you know, for scheduled maintenance. The, if firmware updates, fine, they can check that. But once again, this isn't a measuring tool, right? The the reader itself is a data acquisition tool and not a metering tool. Okay. Okay, Member McIntyre. Uh, through the chair, uh, could we add that it's going to be at uh, our expense uh, on to that motion, please? Okay, I need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Member Cox, seconded by Member Taylor. All in favor? Okay. And that's carried. Thank you. Good. We're we'll moved back down now to. Um, so, was that our new business, Alice? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, we'll move to committee updates. We'll start at Ward 1 and go across. Okay, thank you to the chair there. Uh, uh, Seg Bay Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Thursday, May the 5th was the AGM at the Quarter Grill in Fesserton. It was a great turnout. And it was great to see uh, Mayor Burkett, Deputy Mayor Dunlop, Councillors Cox and McIntyre in attendance. It looks really good that uh, Council's supporting uh, the Chamber of Commerce up in Port Severn. And, and plans are underway uh, for Reconnect Port Severn. And that's still going to be on Saturday, June, June the 25th and that should be a good uh, event there between one and four in the afternoon. Uh, at the Natchitoches Community Heritage Center, uh, they'll be hosting a celebration of life uh, for Shirley Gladall. Uh, it's coming up on this Sunday from two to four. And if you didn't know, uh, Shirley was an excellent storyteller and historian, and she passed away recently and she's, she'll be greatly missed in our community. And the Coldwater Mill, the second floor grand opening is set for Sunday, June the 12th. Uh, lots, of, lots of activities are planned and all are welcome. So uh, th three, three big things happening uh, with, with the committees that I'm on. Thank you. Member Cox. Oh, any questions for Member Taylor? Okay, <laughs> Member Cox. Yeah, I took a conflict resolution course on May 4th and 5th. It was excellent and AMO offers it and they may have it at our AMO conference if anybody's interested. Um, at the chamber meeting, um, we talked about how the COVID numbers are 20% higher than in our area than in the provincial level, but the hospital is hoping to ease restrictions and begin to get back to normal. Unfortunately, and the staff need holidays. Um, I'm assuming Member Batsworth, you'll be talking about position recruitment.
Uh, no, I did not attend yesterday's meeting. Okay. So if you don't mind, I, um, Marcy, okay. So Marcy spoke to us at the um, chamber meeting and they we are in dire straits. Um, 1800 people and more do not have positions in Aurelia, in our area. Um, physicians are choosing not to practice family medicine. 99% come out and they don't wanna do it. The old physicians, they, they, they say they worked to live and the new physicians are, they live to work. No, other way around, live to work for the old ones and work to live. But anyway, bottom line is we are having a terrible time trying to recruit physicians and we have three physicians that are want to retire in the next year or two. Um, this issue is all over on Canada, I guess, and Ontario especially, and they have to come up with ideas. The, the biggest point now is that people are offering them, I read in one area, like they offer them $50,000 to come to the place to live. We we can't do that in every area. And our and only Severn is the one that has the uh, underserviced area for, for this area. So it's something we really have to look at. And I think the people in, they're going to do some publicity and some press releases on this because it's become very hard for all of them to try to find out this committee. And they've worked so hard to do it. Um, Decoration Day in Coldwater, the executive committee of the two, Branch 270, um, they're no longer going to be taking part in the day service. It was a tradition that was to honor the war dead and has been replaced long ago with Remembrance Day. Coldwater was one of the few, if any, that still held a Decoration Day in the summer, and that was from the Legion executive. Um, Lakehead ranked in the top 100 of the Times highest education impact ratings from the chamber. The vote show runs June 10th to 12th. Uh, the business, they're going to have a business expo at Orvis Park and later in the summer. Um, there's also, once again, the, the different happenings down at the um, waterfront. And um, there's still free rapid antigen testing kits from the chamber. If any business would want them, they let them know. The, they had a, we had a, oh, I know, we had our uh, debate on uh, Thursday night. And then they, we got a new grant from the County of Simcoe for Lakes Between the Locks. And that's looking to partner with Simcoe County, Boating Ontario and all tourism organizations. The request was in two, they're putting it in as in two parts just to, to promote the Trans Severn Waterway. And hopefully they're looking also for people to, for uh, businesses to start on it because there really is no place for people to stop and eat. And there'll be a golf tournament in August. They're not going with the all day 18 hole golf tournament. They've, we talked about it. And what they'll do is they'll have it after five so that business owners can go and only do nine holes and then have a meet and greet after. Thank you. So can can I ask you a question? Sure. I missed that Legion thing about the cemetery. It, it kind of got, could you repeat that? Sure, they're not having decoration service anymore because they don't have the volunteers and the remembering of the war veterans that was to remember the fallen heroes and we do it in November. So they've decided that they're not going to do it anymore because most areas don't anymore. Okay, so the township wasn't doing it anymore and they turned off the Legion, now the Legion isn't doing it. That's right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Um, Member Stevens, hold your space bar down, please. I had to... oh, one more thing, sorry. The duck race is this weekend. Okay. So if you want to come and be in the parade, be there at quarter after 12. We'll think of you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, I had two board meetings this past month with the Royal Library. One was for finance and one was for the regular meeting. I also had two meetings last month with SSCA for, on uh, issues that needed to be taken care of. But I would also like to point out that when, when uh, Mr. Betsworth has stepped down now, or about to, uh, he is a sitting member on the uh, Physicians uh, Committee and uh, they'll need an opening. And I sat on that committee for a number of years until being placed by Mr. Betsworth, so I would be quite prepared to do so until the new, co new council can be formalized and, and a new member take over. Um, okay, Member McIntyre. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Washego, uh, Kim's Kitchen, Thomas Kim has opened a new 
Korean style um, restaurant in the old log cabin. Uh, he offers um, 19 or 20 varieties of uh, food, uh, two or three of which are um, Canadian style. Uh, he has a nursery with it. Uh, he's selling plants and um, veggie plants and so on. R really nice fellow. Had a little trouble with the language barrier, but uh, his uh, staff kind of understand him and he uh, they translate pretty nicely. So uh, welcome to Thomas Kim and his uh, uh, group. Um, the Vax bus was in Washago, was very, very busy, May the 12th, um, along with what our friend Mr. Taylor said regarding the um, Segbay uh, chamber. It was a, a wonderful time. Uh, some of us took our spouses, others were unable to, but in any case, we had a, a grand time and uh, I liked it very much. We also attended um, Romero Chamber, uh, I forget the day, but a couple of weeks, a week or two ago. In attendance were um, uh, Mayor Mike, Deputy Jane, Judith, and myself, and very enlightened by some of the comments made by the now uh, provincial candidates for uh, our, our writing, and uh, they all had good comments and good things to say, and it was nice to see that they all turned out. So um, in the main, I think it was a pretty good time and uh, that's about uh, all I got for this report. Thank you. I didn't mean to skip over you, Member Betsworth. Did you have anything you want to say? I, I would like to report um, completely different uh, than I normally do. It's on our committee activities. But I know we have a council meeting, a special council meeting after this, but let me take this opportunity to talk about you. Um, not you, um, Madam <laughs> Chair, all, all of you. Um, first of all, let's start in uh, Ward 5. Uh, Jim, uh, a steady, common sense businessman who has given good advice to this council, and I really hope that he is going to run in the next term. Judith, um, uh, Ron, rather, excuse me first, Ron has been a long serving councillor and mayor of almost 40 years with tenacity and strength of which he has brought to municipal politics in this area. Judith has been a long serving councillor and deputy mayor with a wealth of experience and knowledge that she has been more than willing to share. And I appreciate her sharing that with me because I was a newbie and I needed to come up the learning curve quickly. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark is a counselor who has become a trusted friend and a confidant who keeps getting elected term after term because he serves his constituents well. We will always be friends. And to Jane, another good friend and long serving counselor and deputy mayor who is a principled politician who has an amazing amount of energy. She has been a great source of information and help. And to Mayor Mike, a, ma a mayor who loves people, a man with a compassionate heart who goes above and beyond to help people. Thanks Mike for your help and your leadership. And then to staff, I'd like to say thank you for all your help. And although we may have had differences, we have learned to agree to disagree agreeably. And thank you for staff for keeping our residents safe and well on our roads, waters and septics, and building standards, and fire and emergency standards. And uh, I want to thank each of you for your input into my life and to me serving on this council. And uh, it has been my pleasure. And uh, I'm just sorry I'm moving on, but life changes, doesn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you for those kind words. Okay, Member Burkett, you're up next. Thank you through Madam Chair and John, thank you for those kind words. I'm going to save my comments for you until our council meeting. So I uh, sit on the uh, airport committee on the board, the 50 foot 
runway or widening of the runway is complete. We're now looking at extending it another thousand feet to 7,000 and we're hoping to have funding in the near future. I also sit on the affordable housing and we did have a meeting last week. Uh, we've almost reached our target, as I've said before, of 2,000, uh, 2,590, I think. And I think we're at about 2,200 and we still have two years to go. So it's moving ahead quite nicely. This week, I'll just tell you that tomorrow morning, I, I am at Hawkridge for an OPP ceremony for Cer Central Region. And on Friday, I'm also at Hawkridge again for another OPP ceremony for headquarters. And they both are from 9.30 until 1. And on Saturday night, I'm back at Hawkridge again. Just to let you know that the Aurelia Sports Council is honoring some of their... Uh, accomplishments of some of our athletes in the community and I know that one, that most of us will know one of them. He was our teacher at Park Street, uh, Mr. Dalswell, and he will be receiving a, 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 an award. I know that he's in his 80s now and also some of you might know Mark Shiver and Colin Shiver's son from the Channel Cats. He's also receiving an award. Those are my comments. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think Mr. Dalzo was wrestling and weightlifting for his. Correct. Correct. Okay, so um, the chambers, we, uh, Garfield and I attended the, the dinner in um, the Seg Bay one. It was a really nice night. It um, highlighted everything they're doing, and we have a lot of members from uh, Severn in that. We attended the Romero Chamber, and uh, it was awards night. and. Again, there's a lot of Severin members there and the tent kitchen and bar received an award and we went up there last Saturday night and had dinner. It's really nice. So anybody wants a break away, you're, it's, they've tastefully done the inside. You don't know you're sitting on the side of a highway. It was great. Um, the library, um, so the CAOs of the library were meeting with each other to find out where we're headed now. What are, what are our budgets going to look like this fall going forward when we have different uh, tasks to, to proceed with and what services we may have to drop or what services we'll be able to share with other libraries. So that sits in the future. They continue, I think last month was reported to be the best month since COVID ever started. So that was good and they look forward to moving forward with some possible outside um, projects this summer. Um, the BIA, we had our BIA meeting and everything's moving forward there. Flowers are going up, decorations are there. Uh, we got the, uh, the uh, decorations on the arbors and had a lot of uh, good response back about that. People are happy to see color and shows friendship. Um, the county council, so the MCR is now on hold that had to go in immediately as we were told before. They've worked with the government and they're agreed to let that sit for a bit. There's gonna be two open house meetings for people to come, which we think, I think everybody at County Council was happy about that, that there's no rush for this. Let's get it done right. Um, I'll go back to Village and Hamlets. We had the Village and Hamlets update. Things are moving along there well. And uh, we're just hoping that we can touch base with the damn grill to get that mural up on the wall back there hopefully before we have this bridge opening connection because it would be a chance for a lot of people to view that. So I think that's all I have. There's no more regional review meetings at the county. Yeah, I've got that covered. Any questions? Okay, if not, we will move on to the chief administrator's update. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, just two quick things, just actually things that I wanted to pick up on on your themes. Um, one on the physician recruitment. I wondered if the recruitment committee ever tackles funding models. And it just came to mind when uh, Councillor Cox was talking about it. I'll tell you a little personal story. So my son has been off in university where they have great health care. And he's used it a couple times. He came home to make an appointment 
and was told that he got de-rostered. And of course, you know, he thinks he's an adult, but he's a teenager, so he didn't know what that was. So he hung up. So Mama Bear calls back and says, what do you mean he's been de-rostered? He's been, you know, you gave birth to him. Well, he used the clinic twice at school, so we get charged for that. So then we de-roster. He costs us too much. And so, like, so somebody that's had a doctor for 19 years got turf from a clinic because the doctor if you go to the clinic if you go to any clinic your doctor gets charged there's something wrong with that if you go to a clinic it's because you can't get to your doctor so weird anyways just, well thank you just I share that. that that i i never knew that either so i i don't know yeah anyways um and the second item was just to uh, link back to our decision to go hybrid so last week i got to go to our uh, ontario administrators conference in person for the first time in two and a half years and that was amazing to connect with uh, my colleagues and get new ideas but interestingly enough the theme and the education was all based around trans transformation so everybody is looking at how to do things differently. And but really the gist of it was COVID was awful and we would never have wished it on it, but it sure pushed us to get out of our comfort zone and do things that we never would have thought was possible. Um, and so lots of municipalities are not going back to chambers and they're all finding that they're getting public participation and you know some work from home things and, and whatever. So it was a great conference. I, I learned a lot and made some notes of things that I want to work on here. And that's it for me, Chair Dunlop. Thank you for those comments. Um, so the, I guess the one thing I didn't say was that the county council, we're going back and we're going to share. Um, we don't, if we don't feel comfortable, we don't have to go back. We can just sit here on Zoom and continue on. Or if uh, the mayor wants to go this, this week and I go two weeks, it's up to him and I to decide. But uh, yeah, it's, it's all over the place. So I guess they'll see next week how many people do want to go back. So yeah, it's, it's up in the air. Uh, Lori? I was gonna say, it'd be really interesting to watch how that goes yeah. because we, we struggled to do it with seven. So they've got 32. So I, I'd be really interested to see how the chair manages to know, like if you're at home and Mike's in person, whose hand is he looking at and how is he keeping track? But yeah. it'll be, be, I'll, I'll log in and watch just to, uh, just to see how that yeah. goes. I think, I think we agreed. Did we not agree, Mike, that you would go this time and yes, yeah, and I'd go the next and whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out between us. Member Cox, she's your card yeah, sorry, I forgot something. We had two new businesses open. The one opened quite a while, well, not quite a while, in the winter. Uh, Puzzles and Pastimes, it's a hobby shop in Coldwater. It's excellent. They have tons of, of uh, painting kits and, and um, model kits to make. And then um, this weekend, past weekend, they celebrated together. And the other store is the uh, Cottage Dog dog food store and I was talking to the husband Mike on uh, Monday and they have been bombarded they they had to refill and it's really doing well so um it's it's great to see two more businesses coming and unfortunately um Active North is leaving so we will have an empty store and I guess we'll wait and see what happens okay does anybody have anything else they want to comment on or will we we have no closed session uh, adjournment, Allison. You know, uh, motion oh. just reads that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep, go ahead. That this meeting be in is here by now adjourned at 11.49 a.m. Move we'll in a seconder. Move by member McIntyre, second by member Taylor. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, we'll see you. At, can we have 10 minutes, Mayor Burkett?